हेलो 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 गुड इवनिंग सर हाँ गुड इवनिंग करण क्या हाल है ठीक है बढ़िया सर सर वी आर लाइव ऑन यूट्यूब राइट नाउ स्टार्ट कर दिया अच्छा यूट्यूब पे भी हम लाइव यस सर चलो गुड ठीक है एक्चुअली मैं आई एम ट्राइंग टू ज्वाइन फॉर माई लैपटॉप मैं एक मिनट में कर रहा हूँ ज्वाइन श्योर सर लैपटॉप से ओके सर हेलो सुमित क्या हाल है ऑल गुड सर आप बताओ सब बढ़िया फर्स्ट क्लास सर गॉट फोर वीडियो कंसल्ट इन लास्ट वन आवर थ्री आर म्यूकर इट्स लेफ्ट राइट एंड सेंटर आप बताओ बिल्कुल बिल्कुल हर जगह आ रहा है वेरी And... and let me tell you i am getting call from uh, remote uh, remote places not in urban areas sir too much of urban areas also um, villages from haryana uh, sonipat near sonipat near rohtak and we were just limiting that this uh, steroid use has been done only in urban population but it is not completely true nee nee steroids so everybody is using uh, everybody is using in fact even the uh, उटरिंग so yes. if they don't check the blood sugar they don't know what is the uh, level and how much uh, uh, immunosuppression is there yes yes absolutely
Eu não. या हेलो गुड इवनिंग सर गुड इवनिंग डॉक्टर ठक्कर कैसे हैं सर आप आई जस्ट हर्ड अ वेरी सैड न्यूज सर सचिन गोयल का ही वाज अ वेरी यंग 
ENT surgeon in uh, practicing in North Delhi, sir, here near to my house. Sir. Very sad. Yeah. I was also quite shaken here. Yeah. This is the number five, six. Delhi OI has lost too many people. Yes, too much Very, of them. very difficult. Very difficult situation, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Hi, Smumit. Hi. Hi, Dr. Susan. Gautam. Hello, sir. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Hi, Ravi. How are you? Hi, hi sir. Dr. Gautam, how are you, sir? Fine, fine. Dr. Kochar, sir. Nice to see you there. Hi, sir. Dr. Hi, hi, Dr. Dr. Susan, good evening. Dr. Bahadur, sir, good to see you, sir. Oh, thank you, thank you. Good evening, sir. Dr. Bahadur, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I can see Dr. Lakshmi Vats, ma'am. Good evening. Dr. Kavita Goel, Dr. Rohit Rajput. Hi, how are you? Hi Ravi, how are you? Bus bane, ma'am. I am fine. Hope you are doing well. Yeah. No, ye kya ho raha hai? fraternity mein? Every day we are losing people. Yes, a very sad. I mean, we have no control. And the situation is out of hand, I feel. Yes, actually. Dr. Vikram, good evening. And we have uh, Dr. Jyoti Kumar also from radiology, uh, professor of radiology at uh, from Malana Azad. Good evening, Dr. Jyoti. Hi, Dr. Ravi. Hi. Thank you for letting me in here. I suddenly realized I was in the speaker wala group. Pe aage. Main se sab sa, maybe nee, nee, it is actually we have a very we have a common uh, Zoom ah. ID for everybody. All the participants and delegates also have the same okay, okay. ID. And uh, they are joining with the Zoom only, and uh, we are transmitting this uh, online also via YouTube. Okay, perfect, perfect. So I'm not in the wrong place. I was wondering no, 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 whether you are actually out from here right and join from another link or something. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. Thank you for joining. Thank you, thank you for let, uh, inviting me here. Right. Welcome. So we can have some. Uh, Questions or queries, if uh, there are uh, on radiology, I think Dr. Jyoti can help us during the panel discussion. I will request all the delegates and the members to please switch off their mics. अच्छा YouTube पे भी है वैसे यू कैन ज्वाइन द मीटिंग ऑल्सो ऐसा कुछ नहीं है तो सीधा क्लिक क्लिक करेगा ना जस्ट क्लिक दी दी वो भेजा जो मैंने लिंक भेजा है ना उसका आ जाए क्लिक अच्छा लिंक जो भेजा ना लिंक में कर ले लिंक से कर ले नहीं नहीं पासपोर्ट की जरूरत नहीं सीधा लिंक क्लिक करेगा अपने आप ज्वाइन कर ले Yeah. 
हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग गुड इवनिंग कपिल गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी गुड इवनिंग सर डॉक्टर ईश्वर सिंह टू ज्वाइन आई डोंट नो वेयर ही इज सर ऐसा थ्रेड डाल दिया आपने कि लाइव जा रहे हैं यूट्यूब पे कि सब जल्दी जल्दी ज्वाइन कर लेंगे <laughs> नहीं वो मेरे को लगा कि ऐसा ना हो कि वी हैव ए लिमिटेशन ऑफ थ्री हंड्रेड पीपल इन दिस जूम मीटिंग सो आई थॉट कि ऐसा ना हो बहुत ज्यादा लोग ज्वाइन कर लें तो प्रॉब्लम हो तो इसलिए मैंने यूट्यूब लिंक भी स्टार्ट कर दिया मैंने कहा इफ दे पीपल आर नॉट एबल टू ज्वाइन ऑन जूम दे कैन ऑलवेज सी इट ऑन दी यूट्यूब लाइव सी हंड्रेड बहुत है सी हंड्रेड तो हमारी कभी ए आई की मीटिंग में नहीं <laughs> नहीं ये तो है डेफिनेटली राइट विपिन गुड इवनिंग Hi Ravi sir. Hi Zafar, how are you? I'm good sir. Just recovering. Oh, today date eleven. Oh, yeah, my. Acha, okay. I hope you will recover. Oh, yes, sir. My, my. Okay. Ah, ne kuli dhana hai kya? Right. So I hope everything is fine at Bombay now. The cases have gone down, but the mucus has increased. Yes, sir. Significantly. Right. What about the availability of uh, info in New uh, in Mumbai? Not there, sir. So right now there are three four patients admitted in various places. They are there is no info terrain even plain info terrain available. Oh, that is going to be. But we had a meeting, so there is. You must be knowing Dr. Ashish Bhumkar. Then yes, yes. I, so I, yesterday I attended... there was this Maharashtra CM ka in meeting. Yes, yes I attended that meeting. Try and procure as soon as possible. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Hi, sir. How are you? हेलो गुड इवनिंग कैसे हैं सर आई एम फाइन और तो भी चिंता बैठो कि बाकी पोस्टों पर वैक्सीन क्यों से जल्द डेवलप होता ना मानसिक विकास होता है आज तो रखिए तब तो ना कौन है हेलो मैं ऑडियो हेलो हेलो मंजार हाय हाय गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी हेलो रवि हेलो रवि गुड इवनिंग सर गुड इवनिंग सर यस यू आर ऑडिबल सर चलो 
so should we start so i think uh, we we should start sir it's uh, 6 5 so i welcome you all on behalf of delhi oi and we have a webinar on a very burning topic and that is mucormycosis in cases of covid and uh, as we are all aware that uh, we are going through this uh, difficult time and the cases of covid and this thing covid are there and the mucormycosis, which is uh, uh, present everywhere, it's a fungus. Um, we are well aware of this. It's not something new for ENT person, but now there is wow. sudden spurt in the cases of uh, mucormycosis. So we are here to deliberate upon this burning topic of uh, the hour. So with this, I call upon Dr. Alok Thakkar, who will give an overview of the situation and he will enlighten us with this uh, uh, view. And Dr. Alok needs no introduction. He is professor and head of department at Olney Institute of Medical Sciences, which is a premier institute as uh, all of us are aware. And Alok is uh, past president of FHNO and he is well trained in UK. So with this small introduction of Dr. Alok, I invite him to start the uh, talk of his. Dr. Alok, please. Thank you, Ishwar. Um, it's a rather somber time uh, when we come together because uh, we have had another tragedy in the fraternity and it's really sad that we have had these recurring tragedies over the last few weeks. Uh, yeah, we have been losing so many eminent uh, personalities of ENT and recently today itself there was a death of a young ENT doctor from Rohini. So obviously our respects and homage to all the colleagues uh, who departed, unfortunately. What I'm going to do is try and uh, Set the stage for the for the panel to be followed by Professor Meher, which uh, he'll be taking up in a little while, uh, with regard to how we should respond to this situation. And uh, of course, congratulations to both uh, Dr. Ishwar Singh and Dr. Meher for making this happen, because as I said, it's quite uh, needed. The uh, COVID issue has now come to us, uh, and we need to respond. I just wish to say, I put up this picture primarily to say that this is not quite me and my thoughts, but a consensus which has come through with all of us getting together. And this happy picture was uh, the one which was taken a few weeks before our uh, um, before the before the COVID wave struck us in January last year. And really, it has been these young men and women who have been doing the bulk of the work that uh, I would be presenting to you. We also have uh, collaboration with our colleagues in anesthesia and microbiology, and uh, that, of course, is a large part of what we are doing at this moment. So what I'll try and do is to give you a collective consensus on how we are working at this moment, uh, our thoughts with regard to COVID-related mucor. It will not necessarily be totally comprehensive because it doesn't need to be to be followed by a panel discussion, which would take care of all that is, isn't. But it will be um, an, uh, a conglomeration of the evidence and our own experience and judgment, which is how evidence-based medicine, medicine is to be, which is to be the three-legged stool of, uh, of best available evidence and uh, our experience and judgment. So, um, I will just take you through to, to what we were doing. As Dr. Ishwar said, this isn't quite new. This is a publication from ours, which is yet awaiting publication. It's been mm -hmm. actually under review at the moment from one of our uh, postgrad mm -hmm. students, which is looking at, uh, at our experience with mucormycosis in the period just preceding the COVID epidemic. And we had then treated 25 patients in a two year period, 24 month period. Most of them had diabetes, we know that. Uh, Many of them progressed before they got better, and some of them didn't get better, obviously. So that's just to set the benchmark that the mortality was around 36% at that time, which was 9 out of 25 patients who we lost. Mm -hmm. What we found then was that progression was related to serum ferritin, and this now serum ferritin is now becoming a common uh, test that everybody is doing and understanding, but at that time, it was a little bit of new information for us. 
So that's just to say where we are or where we were. This is a publication by Dr. Panda, Smithy Panda, a colleague who sort of uh, looked at uh, the otolaryngological manifestations in mild and uh, asymptomatic, mild COVID really, and they prospectively reviewed a fair number of patients. It is important to our context today Same because it tells us that among the symptomatic, because 40% were asymptomatic, but among the symptomatic and mild ENT manifestations were among the most common. More importantly, diabetes was seen in 6%. So 6% of a population coming even with mild COVID had diabetes. And in that small cohort, we didn't see any mitosis. But uh, another colleague of ours from medicine, Dr. Meena, has put together this paper, which is again at the moment uh, under review by a journal. And uh, he looked at all the patients with MUCA that we had faced in the first 10 months of the epidemic before this wave came through. And in those uh, 10 months, we have treated 16 patients. Uh, of a total of 6,000 patients of COVID, 16 had uh, mucor, so that's not a very high percentage. Two had uh, two, uh, two of the 6250 were patients who were treated at our facility, and then after the treatment developed uh, mucor, they all had uh, immunosuppression. They both had immunosuppression, as you can see out there. And it came a month or so after the initial treatment of the, of the COVID. But there were other 14 who presented with mucor and were found to have COVID with it. And that is what we are happening, what we seem to be seeing a lot now. And some of these were quite asymptomatic or mild, as you can see. So the majority, 11 of these 14 patients actually presented with mucor and not with COVID. And uh, again, most of them were, uh, had comorbidities. So 12 or 14 had comorbidities. 11 was diabetes, often already present, but sometimes newly discovered. So one patient had a newly dis discovered. We know that COVID can sometimes precipitate diabetes. And yes, lymphopenia was quite frequent. As we know, lymphopenia occurs with COVID. So if you look at uh, the incidence, it is actually quite low. So, I mean, in the delayed group, the 6,000 odd patients that we treated, only two developed COVID after we had finished treating them, but another Few, a lot of patients had presented with COVID and mucor together, or rather had presented with mucor and then on testing found to have COVID running along. This was one in 400. And when you discuss, when I discussed with the group at Gujarat, who've been having a lot of problems, we had a meeting with them a few weeks ago, a few days ago. And even when you look at the little bit of the literature, there's some literature by Dr. Atul Patel from Ahmedabad. This is the kind of figure that seems to be coming through. Of course, it's only an estimate. We can't be 100% sure at this moment, but this is the kind of figure that is coming in, 0.25%, 0.27% of the kind of figures that are coming in with regard to the incidence of mucormycosis in COVID. What were the outcomes? We had 15 patients with rhinoorbital mucormycosis. Uh, seven of them had rhinoorbital cerebral mucormycosis, and we lost one third of them. Dr. Meena also did a review of the literature and the literature was far worse than what our results was. But anyway, that is the, the, the benchmark. Now sort of moving forward or rather moving backward, I have pulled out a few slides from a very old presentation on the same topic that I had taken in 2004. And just to sort of reiterate it, some of the lessons that we had, we were newly discovering then, now they are fairly standard in which we are now regularly implementing. And uh, I quote two figures there, which I used then, two papers. One of them was our own paper on 2003 and another by Talmi et al., which I think is a very good paper and I would recommend you to read it because it had synopsized all the experience till then with 350 odd patients from the global literature. So mortality was high. Now it's happy to know it's a little bit less than what it used to be. We found and Talmi found and we found both that intracranial extension was the major prognostic issue but also what we hadn't quite realized was that unless you sorted the underlying illness or the immunocompromise and unless you had early onset of medical treatment, you often did quite success. It was important to have completeness of surgical debridement, which we all aim for, but it wasn't just surgery, but also focusing on the medical aspects that were both important. Surgery, we emphasized had to be radical and you had to debride till you got bleeding at the periphery. 
but we did say that after this experience and after the literature that uh, perhaps surgery needn't be the first thing you focus on when you get in but focus on getting your antifungal in getting the diabetes under control or whatever it was and then to put surgery so generally we were doing surgery a little bit later not on the day one but maybe day two day and uh, that has been a practice our paper was very keen to point on on uh, clinical pointers for early diagnosis because that is after all the most important uh, aspect in terms of improving uh, results and that was that if there's perinasal cellulitis or perihelar anesthesia or intraorbital anesthesia these are perhaps signs which you should focus on for early diagnosis because if you pick them up early you can obviously make a difference we also had an interesting finding both dr talmi's paper and our paper and uh, both sort of came up with the fact that they commonly thought that there should be bone erosion and bone involvement and mortal bone erosion as was there in the books and the literature was not something we were seeing and in mm -hmm. fact generally what you would see on the ct would be minimal disease not the florid suppuration that you expect in a bacterial sinusitis or because this is non suppurative gangrenous disease so you have non contiguous extension you don't quite see the lamina papyracea eroded before the disease extends into the orbit you don't see the lateral volus sphenoid eroded before you get cavernous sinus thrombosis and um, radiological signs are often quite minimal and in fact we went on to learn from there that minimal radiological signs were more suggestive of fungal pathology and sort of alerted ourselves rather than to find gross disease well these were lessons we learned this is one of the cases i sort of used then in 2004 to say as to how it was presenting and how we should recognize it which sort of said that if you have a patient who has the typical issues with uncontrolled diabetes and maybe some visual impairment and palatal discoloration and if you did ct and you found that not much was wrong with the ct it should point you to the diagnosis rather than point you away from the diagnosis because we all know that the disease spreads by arthritis and maybe even venous along the vascular channels and um, so be careful on that one and yes our focus shifted to not only surgery but also diabetes control and sometimes early presumptive antihypertensive just like we give presumptive antibiotics for patients wherein we believe they have an abscess or a or a bacterial sinusitis or a mastoid abscess or whatever we give but uh, presumptive and uh, antifungals if we feel that this is a fungal disease in the right setting and then go into surgery so was certainly since then the world has changed a fair bit but this uh, sort of stays the baseline for us these two papers on sort of uh, of uh, our thoughts maybe it's because i've been lazy and haven't reviewed too much after but generally this is what we tend to to look at and what this paper told us was that the oral survival was only 47% in the literature and uh, all patients had at least one recognized underlying disorder so comorbidities are very frequent what our paper told us was that perinasal cellulitis and paresthesia was the most frequent early clinical sign usually missed because it was a prospective study so obviously it was a little bit better than doing it retrospectively um and focus on how we should pick them our cases early so I'll just synopsize what we have learned again. So, maximum mortality in week one, and we can minimize mortality by controlling the underlying immunocompromise and the systemic illness. Very important. Early initiation of antifungal treatment. Very important. And radical deprivation. And certainly from that era, things have improved because we now generally tend to give liposomal ampoule, and when we give liposomal ampoule, it's so much easier to get higher doses of. Uh, of um, antifungals in which to my mind is probably why our prognosis has suddenly jumped up from what used to be in the literature at 60 to 70% mortality to now in the region of 30 35% mortality we also both papers said that there were acute and chronic forms and the chronic form was one which had sort of persisted for more than 4 weeks and if you had a chronic form then generally it did well and i think that is relevant to the covid issue because often times we find that these are not acutely fulminant but uh, maybe sometimes sub acute or chronic and so you can anticipate and expect a little bit of a better outcome in that situation this was the data from our paper which basically showed that the only people who survived were either one person with uh, with uh, with a chronic mucor or a couple of patients who had early initiation of of uh, of amphotericin b therapy if you didn't push in your amphotericin b early then these patients didn't make it and there are many impediments to pushing in amphotericin b early 
it may not be available it is too toxic you may not be confident about it and more importantly you may not have an appropriate fungal culture or uh, and may not have the courage to use that medicine without an appropriate fungal culture which basically means that you have missed the boat so the other thing that we i have already said is that the classical described radiology of bone erosion is not seen and you should if you see lack of florid radiological signs you should actually get worried rather than feel relaxed and this is again a recent patient who we saw and these are the kinds of patient we are seeing in this epidemic too this is about the early clinical signs of the rhinological stage which you have to pick up this is a picture from our paper of 2013 and which says that periellar discoloration periellar anesthesia and intraocular anesthesia are the signs that you need to be careful about of course if there's gangrene or the black inferior turbinate then that's obvious this is again from talmi et al who told us that prognosis depends on the extent of disease it is uh, fairly obvious to to all but this is a documentation of that and they gave us four stages and said the disease which was only in the nose had 100% resolution in the orbit 80% our own study showed that orbit was not a poor prognostic sign provided you did the appropriate operation once it started to go intracranially of course it was poor in terms of prognosis but early intracranial could also be generally treated reasonably that's our experience too once the patient becomes uh, unconscious or semi conscious or impairment of cognition or hemiplegia then of course you are in a difficult battle so this is just a synopsis of the same points that maximum mortality in week 1 minimize mortality by medical and surgical issues chronic form is good 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 news and maybe some of the disease we see today is chronic be careful about radiology which is not too bad because that's what you will generally see mortality related to stage and uh, of course it is your job to pick them up in the early stage rather than to pick them up later so we know what to do but now how do you do that so this is how we are doing things so how do you organize your clinical care so this is how we are doing things and i'm sure all of you are doing the same things so yes uh, my colleague dr nikhil tandon from uh, from uh, from endo sort of picked up fairly early and said to us that look you guys probably need to ramp up on your ampho b because this is soon going to be a difficulty and we have worked at the hospital to to create awareness and at least rank up our supplies how long they will last we will see but we have raised ampho b and we have fair amount of ampho b now we had a consensus Uh, in the department uh, and uh, got together as to how we treat these patients not that we don't know how to treat these patients but obviously nice to sort of come together and 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 review just like we are doing today dr sikka is our nodal coordinator from the department because uh, we have so many sites we have a site at nci where dr smriti is and dr anup are looking after patients we have a site at av6 we have uh, av2 where dr hitesh is looking after we have trauma center where rajiv and so chitra looking after and arvind has been looking after so so and then of course we have our own ward so a coordinator to look at all these issues um, we have set up a multidisciplinary clinical care team with the endocrinologists with the covid care anesthesiologists and medics and with the ofta people and the mycologists of course who is doing the testing for us uh, we have of course enhanced our communication on whatsapp and given online dashboard uh, wherein we get uh, this is just a, a shot from the online dashboard of last evening when we had 50 patients i checked a little bit a little while ago we had 61 now and uh, this is how we are trying to manage things but there's some interesting things here on this dashboard which i just want to highlight these are early impressions early days things will clarify as time goes on but um, we still have the odd patient who presents with with mucor before the covid but generally we are having covid presenting before the mucor and there's generally a time lag of a couple of weeks 10 days 15 days 17 days the gujarat experience also seem to indicate two weeks or so so generally covid uh, and two weeks later you get the mucor and that is why the covid peak was two weeks ago and now the mucor peak is what we see now hopefully it will come down interestingly a lot of patients have been have an own i've been on home isolation they haven't had very severe disease a lot of patients have mild to moderate disease some have had severe disease not showing in this small snapshot but if you look at all our 60 patients some have had severe disease but most are mild and moderate 
most have not needed oxygen. Some have, but most have not needed oxygen, but most have had Visalon. That is where the problem seems to be. There's been a lot of high dose steroid around and this high dose steroid is what seems to be creating havoc. And uh, of course, uh, a lot of patients are diabetes. So generally it is the diabetics who are coming in with this. We are again seeing that the ferritin is high, lymphopenia is there. But this is the pattern of disease that we are tending to see now. The principles of management we have already laid out as to how we were treating these patients. We are treating them the same way till we learn new, if any different, but today we are treating them the same way. And uh, we have created uh, communication for patient precautions and checklists for COVID care teams. And of course, uh, Dr. Ishwar is familiar with it, Ravi is. And some of you others may also have seen our, uh, our document. So this is a document for guidance for patients. It tells them what is mucormycosis, that it's a fungus, uh, it's not a new disease. And it sort of says that mucor infection may occur during COVID or a few weeks after so that they continue to be careful. We talk about what is causing the mucor surge. And in our book, there are three things that are causing the mucor surge. There is immunocompromise because of uh, COVID itself. There is the diabetes which many of these patients have or the diabetes which is precipitated by COVID in these situations and thirdly it is the immunosuppressive treatments that many of these patients are happening and of course the final prognosis depends primarily on the degree of immunocompromise and if you put all these three together then the cocktail can be very difficult to handle which is what is happening if somebody has less than these three then that is good news if somebody has all three it's a little bit of concern we have listed out what are the alarming symptoms to watch out and we emphasize and I emphasize here also that the emphasis has to be on detecting them at the nasal stage and we have to look at these early signs which we picked up in terms of perialer anesthesia and infrabital anesthesia and of course the discoloration and the mucopurulent discharge or the purulent discharge that these patients may have. We can obviously pick them at the eye stage but then that is it would be better, far better to do it earlier. We have a list of do's and don'ts, which are generally sensible things than just telling patients to follow basic hygiene and cleanliness and follow medical advice. Yes. We know that this, this fungus is ubiquitous. The spores are there in the air. We know there are seasonal issues. There is doubt as to whether it's a commensal or not in the nose. Uh, some say yes, some say no, but, uh, but it's certainly there in the air. And uh, it seems that the oxygen is not a major concern from my discussions to people, but at the end of the day, certainly basic hygiene is necessary. We give advice on what to do if you have these symptoms, that is fairly obvious. We similarly have a, a treatment uh, care guidance uh, document, uh, which again uh, tells us how to treat our, tells us, our I mean, because of big group, we have residents, we have uh, such a big multi-speciality group, so it's necessary to have this kind of communication. So not that anybody doesn't know, but sometimes you just need to restate these things. So we tend to categorize patients as COVID positive and COVID negative and the COVID negative come to us and the COVID positive go to the COVID care facility, the many that we have. And it is important to note that what we are finding is that most of these patients are not getting COVID negative at day 10 of their illness as is generally anticipated. And it seems that these are patients with immunocompromise, which is obviously causing the mucor and which is also causing a persistence of the COVID positive status. So I would say 80% of our patients are COVID positive currently, even though they are more than 10 days from the infection. Why the surge in mucormycosis? I already said to you the three things that I talked about. The COVID itself causing immunocompromise, the, 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 the diabetes or the impaired glucose tolerance because of uh, COVID, pre precipitated by COVID. And thirdly, the steroids and immunocompromising agents that are being used. We have a checklist of sentinel signs to be monitored for all our patients admitted under COVID care, which is basically very similar to what is there in the patient document, a little bit more in terms of eye signs. And we have outlined the treatment principles, which I've already told you about, which is about treatment of comorbid illness and blood sugar control are very important. We need to review treatments to minimize immunocompromise, twice to daily evaluations as per the mucor checklist, or at least daily. Confirmation of diagnosis by COH smear or biopsy. KOH smear is obviously giving not the same yield as a biopsy, but at the end of the day, now, a biopsy has difficulties in COVID positive patients, so at least a COH smear to get started. Radiology, I already told you the caveat about radiology. And we have taken a call that in the patient 
we are going to move ahead with presumptive amphibi in patients who seem to be fungus. Uh, um, uh, so, and we are doing that. And as I said, early surgical debridement, it's not that we delay surgical debridement, but we just want to emphasize that it's the medical treatment which is as important as And because this can't quite take the whole detail, so we have a, a web link with it in which you click, you can actually go down and see more detailed guidelines. So if you want them, you can see them. They've been, they are with Ravi and with, uh, with Dr. Ishwar, and you can see them. So that's it. This is where we stand today. As I said, minimize mortality by the same principles of medical and surgical treatment together. And these are our thoughts with regard to early diagnosis, maybe prevention and uh, treatment. So thank you from all of us. Certainly, if there are any questions. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, sir, for an excellent overview of the uh, mucormycosis. Uh, Dr. Ishwar, are you there? I think... Uh, hello. Uh, sir, uh, you have to unmute. Dr. Ishwar, you have to unmute yourself. Am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. No. yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much, Alok, for such a wonderful talk. You are entitled, uh, this thing enlightened everyone, and uh, we are grateful. And you are given your uh, this thing uh, how to manage and uh, how we can go ahead with the uh, communication and uh, keeping data. So, with this, I request you to be there online because you are also be a panelist so that we can have an expert opinion from you and you can pitch in whenever there is you have to say something. And with this, we come to the next uh, topic, and that is the <coughs> this uh, panel discussion. So I request Dr. Ravi Meher, who is a colleague of mine. He's a professor at uh, um, Maulana Jad Medical College, and he has uh, done a fellowship in uh, autology, and his topic of interest is FES and uh, autology. So with this brief introduction, Ravi is uh, at present the secretary of uh, Delhi OI. So with this brief introduction, I request Dr. Ravi to introduce the panelists and go ahead with panel. Ravi? Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So we'll start with the uh, panel discussion. Uh, let me share my screen first. So can you uh, see my screen? Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ishwar Singh, for introducing. Uh, Dr. Ravi, hello. Uh, I can see uh, Dr. Jyoti Kumar, uh, Professor of Radiology. So what we will be doing will be the, on the yeah, yes, 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 she is there uh, as a special yeah. NYT, she is there. Yeah, you can uh, uh, direct some questions to her also in the panel because I'll be... Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, uh, may I know who is uh, this? Uh, Manish, I'm not a... Manish, Manish, yeah. See you. Manish, Acha, Manish Munyal. okay. Sure, 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 Manish. I have already introduced her uh, during the um, uh, start of the uh, webinar. So uh, we'll be actually dealing with the practical aspects of the uh, management of mucor in a post-COVID patient, right? And we have a very eminent panelist with us. Uh, we have Dr. P.K. Rator, who is the director, professor, and head at Maulana Azad Medical College. Uh, we have Dr. Vipin Aroda, who is director, professor of ENT at UCMS. Then we have Dr. G.B. Singh. Uh, he's professor at Lady Harding Medical College. Dr. Manish Munjal, he's senior consultant at Sir Gangaram Hospital. Then we have Dr. Kapil Sikka, who is professor at Ames, New Delhi. Uh, then we have Dr. Shashidhar, T. Shashidhar. He's a senior consultant at Artemis Kurgaon. And last but not the least, Dr. Sumit Mrig. He's also a, a senior consultant at Max Hospital. 
So it's straight away go to the panel. Okay. Uh, so my question to all the panelists, I think we can have a opinion of all the panelists one by one. What is the incidence and number of cases you have seen of post mucor uh, post COVID mucor mycosis? And uh, what is the uh, duration after after COVID? So can we have comment from uh, maybe from uh, starting from Dr. Rathore, sir? Hello, Ravi. Yes, sir. Am I audible now? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes, you Actually, are, you are uh, audible, sir. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, Ravi. I'll uh, try to answer that. Uh, usually, this uh, mucor is uh, seen about uh, after six weeks of the COVID. It is not a immediate type of uh, fulminating disease, as Dr. Alok has just. Uh, told us, and uh, it is more of a chronic disease. In in this first wave, we have seen very few cases, and in second wave, it has risen to a exponential level. And as specifically, there is no institution which is keeping the data of mucor mycosis because they are related to the transplant cases where the mucor is actually taken care of. The data is kept in the cases where the liver. A transplant is there, where the renal transplant is there, and uh, uh, roughly it can be divided that in those cases only the mucor is seen. But in this aspect, I don't think we have any data to show you that what is the incidence and time period. I have already told. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, can uh, Dr. Munjal, you are seeing lots of mucor cases at Gangaram. Can you update about your uh, cases and your uh, number of cases and the uh, duration after which it is seen? Well, the amount of cases we are seeing are unexpectedly high. Um, it could be because uh, there was a, a little bit more media hype about Gangaram, a hospital reporting. I was there on TVs and all, unfortunately, fortunately for this reason. Uh, but uh, we have had, uh, we at present, we have 54 admissions of mucor in Gangaram, almost as much okay. as uh, AIMS is having. Um, yesterday, I was informed that uh, we have been given two separate wards only for mucor because our residents are finding it extremely difficult to navigate uh, different different beds as they get admitted. But uh, uh, the one thing which is very alarming uh, relates to the second question is that we have more patients of COVID positive mucor in Gangaram now than we have COVID negative mucor, which means um, they might not be having very active disease. There are very few having active yes. symptoms of COVID, like uh, on oxygen dependence or, uh, or, or on other comorbid conditions related to COVID. But uh, in, in fact, some of them have their first RTR report, RT-PCR report as early or symptoms reported four weeks ago, three weeks ago. But a considerable amount, maybe because of steroids, are turning to be still RT-PCR RT positive. And we have no other choice but to give them a separate COVID board mucor, which is providing us an extra challenge to treat because um, there, as you can make out, it's very difficult to go into COVID wards, get their tests done and bring them out. Uh, so this would be in the range of 50-50 uh, almost nowadays. But uh, as the uh, symptoms, as, as we are uh, continuously having more and more cases, I can tell you that even the COVID positives will uh, are matching the non-COVID one. Although I would say that in the coming next few days, because of the positivity report coming down of Delhi getting better, I think the non-COVID will exceed the COVID ones. But um, uh, four to six weeks, yes, first week it was exactly that, four to six weeks after COVID. Now it, I would say it is uh, more like three weeks, uh, I would say safely after the COVID infection. And within two weeks of starting steroids, that is how I would report it as. Okay, okay so, uh, so comments from other uh, panelists, Dr. Sumit and Dr. Shashidhar. I would, uh, I would completely agree with Dr. Manish. Uh, we have seen a lot of uh, upsurge of cases in the last week. Before that, uh, frankly, we did uh, one of two, three, four cases, but they were uh, spread apart few weeks. But last week, we have seen a lot of upsurge of cases. And I would agree that the challenge in most of these cases is that all of them don't have their COVID negative report. In fact, end of second week and the third week, we are getting uh, calls from patients. See, Dr. Ravi, we must realize that 
most of the patients are coming when their eyes swelling they are not able to understand that have they got mucor or not they are reporting or calling for help once their eye is involved or they have started to have some kind of a hypoesthesia or paresthesia on the face decreased vision and the blurring and when we go back to the history the covid symptoms were about 2 and 1/2 to 3 week so i think covid rt pcr is not something which we should rely upon because if we put our our hands on to that the treatment will be a lot delayed because most of them will remain positive for about 2 weeks so i think i agree with what okay. dr manish said that the challenge would be covid positive or covid negative patients so we are also getting these patients admitted in a special ward now and uh, we are getting rt pcr done but if you are seeing that they are almost at the end of two and a half weeks to three weeks of their first start of symptoms so it's not to worry because the viral load will be very low also we are okay. getting lot of these patients from rural parts now not only from the urban and their history of home intake of steroids and i would say that not a very very long intake think, uh, we can about talk about the uh, days but predisposition was most of the patients have got uncontrolled diabetes okay so we will talk about the uh, yeah. causes of uh, uh, mucor uh, later uh, dr shashi you have some input about the uh, incidents in your institution shashi uh, your mic is off please switch on the mic yeah we were preparing a manuscript and for last one year we had 10 cases and they all came in a one month gap and everything in the last one week we admitted 14 patients under my care and all of them have one similarity it's in the april first week and later none of them came in march so i think this has certainly something to do with the new variant of the virus uh, and i have compiled a, a few data which i'll show it later but definitely uh, it's like 5 to 7 times more than the previous year's rate so any any other input from uh, other panelist yeah ravi can i say something yeah yeah sure vipin okay. yes ravi i just want to share some epidemiology because we are having the patients at uh, two facilities one is a main gtb hospital where we keep less Uh, where we keep 750 patient who are less comparatively less sick as compared to another facility which is a 500 bed icu facility which has newly come up so when i compare the incidence of micor mycosis it is far more in those in in the icu facility where more sick patients are going we started that facility only on 13th of may only only 3 4 days back and i have seen two cases of micor mycosis in that facility because more sick patients are coming over there and uh, they are developing this infection uh, uh, more often so i think it it is related to the sickness and the uh, maybe the virulence of the virulence of the virus which causes more immunosuppression or as uh, sumit was saying that it has something to do with the uh, this strain also with the in, in this particular wave and sridhar was saying that there is something this virus is more virulent so i certainly agree with that and we are getting more sick patients uh, during this wave as compared to the last year right right so i think uh, what uh, we can gather from uh, everybody's experience is that there is a definite increase in the number of cases after second wave and uh, what i could gather is that uh, it is basically acute condition and it is occurring within 2 3 weeks of covid positivity so that uh, i think we can uh, summarize that uh, there is a definite definite increase in the incidence of uh, mucor mycosis after uh, the second wave and uh, uh, we go to the Ravi, next I, yes Ravi, dr gautam you yeah. want to say something See, you know, when when there was the first wave we had mucor mycosis mucor mycosis cases coming to us after covid being treated right. but right now right now the cases that we have in fact just about Two three days back, we had an admission in our pathology department. We don't know the COVID status of the patient. I think it's come out to be positive now. Now we are having patients who are coming with COVID and mucor mycosis. Initially, right. after the first wave, we had patients who would come to us and we would take a history and they'd say, "Yes, we had COVID." But right now, the patients that we are having, the right are although they are being all uh, either it is that they are being treated for COVID and right after that. Within a period of about two to three weeks, they are reporting for mucor mycosis, and most of them are not. Their status is not known, and subsequently they turn out to be uh, COVID positive. 
right so right. the uh, can i uh, actually i yes kapil kapil hi thakkar sir mentioned uh, most of the things from our department we have uh, around 61 cases uh, that are under treatment in various facilities so if i would uh, sort of try to summarize that we have mostly patients who come after 2 to 3 weeks after uh, sort of receiving uh, the covid treatment or steroids but there are cases which are coming with coexistence so their covid is not getting negative and moment they come to you with mucor and you test them and they are covid positive but bulk right. of the patients who are coming to us they are testing rt pcr or true net cv net positive uh, maybe more than 90% of times so for out of 61 i think we had only 8 or 10 patients who who were cb net or true net negative rest of them are positive and uh, if they are positive then as per policy we cannot talk about viral load or other things but we have to keep them in, uh, in covid uh, facility not keep them in with other yes. about yes not a couple right. can i just make a comment yes you know Please, all okay. these all these patients if you test them for cb net yeah, even yeah. after recovering from covid cb net will be positive for about 3 months totally so, agree So okay. CB net, CB net may not be the right investigation to make a to make a distinction whether the patient is COVID positive or negative once he has got COVID. So maybe a what what we are doing because yeah. RT PCR may take about eight to twelve hours at max to come. So we do a rapid antigen test. We admit the patient and before the if the patient needs any debridement or an urgent emergency, then we immediately send an RT PCR. But definitely not CB net because it will remain positive for about three months after uh, COVID comes into. The Okay. Okay. I think we can uh, right. Switch on to the next slide. What are the risk factors for development of mucor in post-COVID patients? So, Dr. Rathore, sir, would you like to answer this? Uh, yes, sir. Ravi. Yes, sir. Uh, as we have just seen that a uncontrolled diabetes is the main culprit. Right. It is sir. followed by <laughs> the you know, use use of the systemic steroid. If the systemic steroids are used. For more than three weeks, then again there is a problem, and then right. we have a mechanical ventilation problem. So suppose the patients who are on air, they have less incidence of mucor, and the mechanical ventilation, whether it is with given with the humidifier, and uh, what type of humidifier is used, all these factors have a role to play, because if some in some cases even the humidifier is not daily changed, so they have a higher incidence of mucor later on. also there is a question mark about the medical oxygen as well as the industrial oxygen normally what we do the medical oxygen is about 93% which we use so, suppose we raise it to 100% uses then the damage will be more and the incidence of uh, mucor will be more similarly the, the industrial oxygen needs needs a proper setup and it has to be air purified first so now these are the small factors which are not very much In in a peripheral hospitals, in main hospitals we are taking care of all these things, and these and along with these the use of the toxic uh, toxic gamay also is associated with the higher incidence of mucor mycosis in post COVID patients. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Any comment? Yes, sir. If uh, uh, in this cell office, yes, doctor, is responsible then uh, all the patients who are receiving uh, oxygen should have uh, an. And this uh, co and this thing uh, mucor mycosis. If that is the source of infection, no, no, no. My my my. This thing is what what is the what is the setup that uh, the medical oxygen actually we is absolutely safe. We cannot do industrial oxygen needs to be put in the uh, first uh, a clearing zone, which is again a uh, different setup. In more of the, most of the medium grade hospital, it is not available. But so, all those patients who are receiving oxygen, then they everyone should have it. It's only few selected who get this, or who have diabetes, or who have been given steroid right at the beginning. They are the one who are getting mucor mycosis. Not everyone. No, no. This is one of the factor, Doctor Ishu. I have to enumerate it: the diabetes okay. and systemic steroid. Not even oral steroid. Hmm. Even systemic steroid for more than three weeks. There is a question whether the home treatment of the steroid people are taking. Whether it is associated with mucor, it is less. Systemic steroid is more associated with mucor, and along with the mechanical ventilation, humidification, these are the various factors. And if patient is having a underlying lymphoma or any you know compromised status, then definitely the incidence will be higher. 
ओके सर थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर दी कमेंट सर आई थिंक सर इट इज दायोलॉजी ऑफ डायबिटीज कोविड एंड स्टीरोइड्स दीज आर द थ्री इंपॉर्टेंट थिंग्स विच आर एक्चुअली रेस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर डेवलपमेंट ऑफ न्यू करियर कोविड पेशेंट ये डॉक्टर मनीष यू वॉन्ट टू एड समिंग फर्स्ट <laughs> in a covid infection what is the use of azithromycin or doxycycline from the first day and has anybody seen any prescription of a covid patient without one of these antibiotics you tell me and we all know that antibiotic uh, misuse will predispose a person to uh, to a probably fungal infection so these are the things and that is the exact uh, reason why i'm pointing out the second thing which colleagues and physicians are now making is you uh, start the use of uh, azoles lower uh, quality azoles like uh, fluconazole and voriconazole in treatment as a prophylaxis in mucormycosis it's a very dangerous trend fungi works on the principle of competitive inhibition and if you do not target the right antifungal if you distribute the infection with antibacterials and lighter antifungals you are going to really complicate the mycormycosis so this is also one thing which i feel is a bit a factor this time more than the last time dr ravi uh, yeah, i have yeah. summarized all the factors possible regarding the uh, what causes the mycormycosis it's a, just a single slide uh, if you want i can share it uh, which is includes the molecular basis as well in a okay. single slide If, uh, if you, then i have to put put off my slide then yeah. only can share yeah. ravi can i add this, something this is extremely i think you can just speak from the slide uh, we can just listen to it oh the, you you have to see that picture seriously then you will understand what ravi can i add on. something here acha ju just a minute dr gautam we uh, we yeah, want to have the you know, i'll just tell you hmm. one thing uh, i have stopped ravi, sharing I... the slide hmm. okay. yes yes dr gautam you See, you know what is that? It's very important for all of us here to understand that we are number two in diabetes in the world. The maximum second number of cases are maximally seen in our country. And prior to having this COVID mucormycosis, the maximum number of mucormycosis cases have also been reported from India only prior to COVID infection. The most important thing is that COVID is a diabetogenic virus. It goes and destroys the islets of the pancreas. It starts, you know, completely, you know, uh, disequilibrating a patient of diabetes mellitus. It's, it's in its uh, in its etiopathogenesis, and then you know what happens? Your physicians are not able to control the diabetes. One of the other extraneous factors is to have steroids. Okay, and then all of a sudden you have you are having a surge of this mucormycosis in our country. We are I, I, the diabetes capital in the world. and we are having a virus which is itself a diabetogenic virus and of course you know mucor has been india is the capital for mucormycosis prior to even covid infection now what is there that since you have a covid infection i mean this is perfectly natural i mean okay. yes of course diabetes is a predisposing factor taking steroids is a very important predisposing factor but much more important than that is that the misuse of steroids by the medicine people you know they are not using the guidelines even uh, patients who are being home treated right i think, uh, I think yes okay. dr gono i think uh, we need to uh, see the slide of dr uh, shashi so so the simple idea is that the rhizospores are everywhere in our body and the nose is the com common harbor of that and it comes in three forms it's called the resting spores the swollen and the hyphae your macrophages and neutrophils cannot actually get a mucor if there is no breach in the basement membrane so deviated septum prongs nose picking and non specific antibiotics and other things they actually result in breach especially if you are giving a 15 liter oxygen the crusting is very high in the nose so this is the preliminary step where the spores will actually enter the basement membrane <laughs> then the real game starts when there is a spore your macrophages and neutrophils they treat it like a child they don't even give a immune response absolutely there's no germ they only suppress its multiplication but as soon as they get swollen or they come into the hyphae form the macrophages and neutrophils 
they, they tend to recognize it and they tend to take care of it. Now, what's happening is when you have a diabetes, DK or acidosis or a hyperglycemia, the macrophage function is suppressed for at least two weeks. That's the life cycle of a macrophage. If you have a diabetes, it is going to be suppressed, uncontrolled diabetes, and acidosis, it will suppress it. And for the neutrophils, corticosteroids, IL-6 inhibitors, and the virus itself, because it, 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 it does something called a T-cell exhaustion, it will suppress it for many, many weeks. So normally, the neutrophils are supposed to take care by the NP1 and NP2, which is basically neutrophil huh? uh, protein peptides. But the last step is NP2. here where the iron metabolism is important because even if the uh, mucor multiplies in the soft tissues, it needs something to really enter the blood vessels and then it causes angio invasion in the thrombosis and for which, again, hyperglycemia, high iron state and hyperferritinemia are important. And this is the receptor where GRP78 yeah. kind of takes the normal spore and puts it in the blood cells. Even now, we have a defense mechanism inside the blood vessels, and those are the platelets. And these platelets, they go and wrap around with what we call as a platelet factor four around this, and they, they kind of limit the mucor inside the blood vessels. But if the patient has thrombocytopenia, which is also seen in the new strain, or we are giving heparin, they develop anti-PF4 antibodies, or steroids, or they, we are giving platelet inhibitors. The platelet function is also decreased, and this will again cause a higher chance of angio invasion. And this is the first time ever we have seen a bilateral mucormycosis. This is mind blowing. We, we, I've been in the Medanta and Artemis uh, transplant units. We were backing off BMT patients and uh, uh, liver transplant and kidney transplant. We have never ever seen a bilateral extensive rhinocerebellar mucormycosis. And now we are seeing it. So something really weird is happening here, which is kind of exposing it. And even if you look at the other parts, when you want to raise your immune systems, again, the same corticosteroids and IL-6 inhibitors and viral virulence are the factors which, which kind of take down your immunity. So the answer is straight uh, in front of you. It's hyperglycemia, corticosteroid use, and virus virulence in different forms, in different combination, at different levels in uh, the pathogenesis, which is going to uh, uh, affect. Thank you, uh, Dr. Shashidhar, for excellent uh, uh, explanation. And I think it was a molecular uh, level explanation, which was given by you. Uh, so what we can uh, infer is that the diabetes, uh, the COVID, COVID itself is a diabetogenic stage. Which, which induces damages to the uh, uh, pancreas as told by Dr. G.B. Singh and the uh, steroids. So these three things are actually the main uh, culprit in, in uh, inducing uh, mucormycosis in COVID patients. So we can come to the next slide. I think we will start sharing my screen again. Uh, so... Uh, is it an Indian phenomenon? Because uh, what I have read, I mean, I was trying to search the literature and I could not find uh, mucor cases in uh, uh, US or UK or other countries uh, where there have been very uh, high incidence of COVID patients. So is it an Indian phenomena or we are seeing it in, in our subcontinent? What is the reason behind it? So any, any of uh, the panelists can take this. Yeah, I'll take that. See, yes. you know, we are living in a tropical in, uh, uh, environment, Ravi. You know, we have done studies on fungus. We have done fung fungus study in cholestatoma. We have done fungus studies in biofilms in our institution. And after that, we have come to know that fungus is something very endemic in our country. And I right. told you previously now, it's just that, you know, the maximum number of mucor cases in the world have been reported from India. Right. And diabetes, this, we, we are the second highest number of cases of diabetes in our country. So we should have expected this. Right, we sir. did not expect this. Our uh, medical uh, people did not expect that we will have fungus infection post-COVID. COVID is a diabetogenic, you know. I was talking to some medical specialist, you know, once, and he, he very bluntly put it that we were expecting this. But the, I know this patient will have mucor. I, I said, how do you know? He said that we are expecting, we are seeing pulmonary mucormycosis, we are seeing reduced uh, mucormycosis because 
usually what happens the diabetes gets uncontrolled because of the virus you know it goes and destroys the islets of the pancreas and the moment you're not able to control diabetes you know a number of other factors are there the age factor of the patient so many other factors and then he says that there are always chances of having a mucormycosis so you are surprised as an ENT surgeon but we as medical specialists treating covid right right uh, okay uh, dr gautam dr kapil you have some point Me. No sir, I just wanted to uh, ask. I am not sure, but has weather or humidity to do something? Uh, what what the yeah, yeah. Yes. That? exactly? Yes, exactly. We are living in a tropical environment. Virus is this uh, fungus is in there. He doesn't seem to agree with that. But I I I, I, I I I have this question in mind. I but I just wanted uh, others' opinion also for. I think mucor is ubiquitous in our environment, and it is present everywhere. The spores are there in the environment, and uh, the... it is not there in London or New York. Uh, in environment it is it is Sir, there can i is there dr ravi can i make a comment but uh, what what i have like what i have uh, uh, searched in the literature is that most of the patients uh, in us they are getting uh, uh, pulmonary aspergillosis yeah no no sir after covid not mucor so sure. mucor is actually uh, i mean the the incidence is very high in india but it is not there in other uh, countries see ravi you are not known but if why it is so look, if we, if we look yeah, at the transplant yeah, case series they are the maximum mucors in worldwide in us and uk and these these are the post transplant patients india has least post transplant mucors actually not so, not sinus we are so the spores about, are already so there everywhere in the world not sinus I'm, i'm saying the spores are there in everywhere is just no, the I'm, are you are you talking care, about post care, sinus mucors also or or is it only the pulmonary and systemic disseminated mucormycosis uh, so, sinonasal so, mucormycosis and pulmonary they 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 might they be are, having a distinct uh, pathogenesis two thirds of all mucormycosis is always sino uh, sino rhinocerebral mucormycosis what i'm trying to say is if you look at and screen this uh, case series it was always there it was there throughout the world and right now we are just burning our hands and we are not able to understand but it's it's more to do with the management and the virus strain both rather than the environment because uh, you know even singapore has a tropical climate and there's so many countries which are nearby india they have a tropical climate kerala does not have mucor mycosis because the steroid is cannot be written by a practitioner if you if you get a covid so the, that's the, a news the, to me dr shashi i mean kerala they don't have mucor No, they are not seeing any make a mucor no, case. They, they don't have that. The, all the people so, which I'm talking to, no, 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 they, they're no. not getting a so surge. How, like how they are treating their uh, COVID patients? Because the government does not allow other people to write prescriptions indiscriminately. But the day you diagnose, the PHC worker will give you the medication, and the oxygenation is not done at home. It is done in the hospital in a proper uh, monitored setup. So, so what do you think uh, dr sashi uh, i mean the uh, steroids which we are giving here in aims or maybe molana azad or uh, we are give, we are misusing steroid or we are giving so the highest movies? series is home home isolation patients and they so, may i come they, they are not yes, monitored they are okay. not monitored so the, that's okay. what dr. i'm trying Thakar, to say dr sir your expert comments sir so i agree with totally with sashi that it is probably the difference in treatment which is making the huge difference we can find scapegoats in the fact that we live in india and our weather is different but all parts of india are seeing it very different kind of environments and uh, there is seasonal uh, there is seasonal variation with mucor but it's not very clearly identified and uh, i mean the one of the one of the publication from our uh, stable which i showed you wherein my medical colleague had reviewed uh, publication from the other places there are reports from austria from the us from everywhere um it's uh, just that uh, uh, in the first wave we were sort of focusing on hydroxychloroquine as a treatment and now we are focusing perhaps wrongly on too much steroids as a treatment if you look at our dashboard people on home isolation are having such high doses of steroids such high doses of steroids Yes. In our practice, we don't use steroids for mild and moderate, and if we use, we only use in the second phase of the illness when the patient is beyond the viremic phase and is coming on to the phase of of uh, immune uh, hyperimmune phase. So, but what is happening is that people are using steroids from day one. It possibly exacerbates the viremic phase. 
it uh, certainly causes no benefit they're using in very high doses they're often using without doctor's prescription and they're using with doctor's prescriptions and the havoc we see is i think primarily iatrogenic of course covid has a role um but uh, but uh, no i mean we couldn't uh, we, maybe maybe climate makes a difference but there has been that suspicion with mucor for a long time but uh, in this situation it's not the climate which is doing much there okay sir uh, thank you for the comments dr dr alok say uh, this uh, mycormycosis has been uh, reported from the western france i got i saw one report uh, today itself it has been reported from kuwait hot and uh, hot climate from france where it must be cold so it is prevalent all over uh, the world it's only the what is said steroid misuse or the patient is diabetic that that the panelists have said is are the right uh, underlying causes which lead to or predisposes and covid itself is a immunosuppressive or uh, it leads to leukopenia or that kind of thing which lead to the uh, reduced immunity of the patient right sir right sir thanks for the comment sir uh, sir there are there are few cases i mean occasional case case reports from us or uk or france but the large series actually are from india only in fact uh, when i search in literature there were three large series of uh, uh, mucor cases in post covid patient till april 2021 uh, right and there were occasional case reports from other countries right so definitely uh, we are having a increase in incidence of mucor cases because of the diabetes as well as the uh, high dose of steroid or misuse rather misuse of steroids right so we can come to the next uh, slide how to identify red flags or early signs for diagnosing mucor dr manish munjal um yeah these are what you are showing the pictures these yeah, are these the are advanced cases so this cases. is the how we actually I, we get in I, our institution i don't <laughs> want to see these cases i am seeing them day and night <laughs> right, right. Uh, so, but but what i am seeing in the uh, outpatient are two type of people one are the covid uh, the the mucor phobics and one are the the prank ones frankly uh, it is very difficult to uh, distinguish between the two and uh, because of the fear of the so called black fungus and uh, it's a misnomer and prop. i have a little bit of social responsibility in owning the name because <laughs> the the last hello please please switch off your mic i request everybody to switch off their mics oi oi it yeah in the last pandemic i had uh, written a article for times of india when we had uh, red flagged it and i don't know because of the color of the fungus on the rhizopus on the sugar cane which is black i named it black fungus in the article and i don't know why uh, this black fungus <laughs> has become so much this thing that uh, everybody is mentioning this name but uh, somewhere so i know now uh, where I, the nomenclature of black fungus yeah, comes somewhere in the nomenclature no. i might have read you are the it culprit <laughs> yeah there was a bit of i agree with that the names can become viral we can all see that but red flags may uh, i can very well tell you ravi that um, what i mentioned uh, very inspicuously by dr um, uh, alok thakkar the difference between the sensation on the two cheeks is probably the most important sign that i've been seeing in uh, this thing and for that you don't need to press the cheeks too hard just ask the patient to close the eyes and if you can make the sensation uh, difference between the two cheeks of course the patient has come to you with nerves pain and before you examine the uh, the the patient just identify these factors because it differentiates it, uh, from a lot of other neurological problems if there's infra orbital paresthesia this is a very important sign for uh, i mean uh, sign that you can elicit second thing of course the usual things if uh, there is usually a brony swelling most of the most common finding that i have seen is uh, with which patients has also come is the brony swelling below the cheek but mind you because of high dosage of steroids many people people are just coming with facial puffiness and uh, non uh, infective uh, swelling also so cannot have a total um, suspicion on that basis but of course all an ent surgeon needs to do is examine the nasal area very well then the sensation thing i have told you then then deep sensations for any tenderness 
and finally do not miss seeing the uh, gingival buccal sulcus because there's a lot of there's a one more different different clinical variant is the upper jaw osteomyelitis happening in such cases where you will see periodontal um, and micro abscesses and uh, a little bit of tenderness in those abscesses you might have a completely normal nose completely normal eye but still these patients are having um, uh, uh, or this mucormycosis and that is probably mixed infection but very difficult to take biopsies you have to um, puncture those cavities and then take swabs to uh, identify such people we are doing that so these are the variations this time that we are seeing in the plethora of mucormycosis of course uh, the inside story is still the quite th the same when you look inside Again, the sensation not being there in equal cavity, even if you don't have findings like black SCR or something, but if you can just rub this with a cotton swab and feel that this patient is not feeling the swab as much as he's feeling in the other cavity, again, is a pointer uh, and uh, the usual SCARs and all those things are obviously there. So these are, these are my ways which bring me uh, on the alert for uh, possible mucor. We are very prompt. We are uh, uh, taking biopsies. Say Zada, we are taking um, these uh, um, with a black slave force. We are just we'll, taking. We'll talk uh, about the diagnosis okay. part later. Uh, like, okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, Sumit, uh, you want to add something? Yes. Uh, sir, I think the pictures that we have shown is uh, actually a fairly advanced disease when the patient by itself will notice that he has got a very prominent uh, sign. But what I would say that we have seen about quite about 15 to 20 patients who have uh, contacted us that they have got this unilateral headache and sinusitis like picture. And I would say that uh, very early signs before even there is a progression of mucormycosis, like when the spores are inhaled through the nasal or the nasopharyngeal route, uh, there is a uh, sequence which takes place before it forms an SR. That's an end result actually because of the invasion and the death of the tissue. We have seen about 15 to 16 patients with, who have come with their CT scans with unilateral sinusitis post-COVID recovery. And on doing a, just a simple nasal endoscopy, the little more darker reddish loss of that pinkish uh, uh, onto the middle terminate mucosa, they are started to turn into little dark red and towards the bluish before becoming black. So I would say that and a little bit of pus coming out through the middle meatus. So what we have done in few cases, we are trying to set up a, a kind of a helpline that if any of the patient who is discharged COVID, post COVID, develop any sign of any heaviness of the head or a little bit of headache, don't ignore that. Please visit for an endoscopy. Because I think the first sign which is seen before osteomyelitis comes into picture because before loosening of teeth happens or uh, you you get this black SR is the nose and the paranasal sinuses and the start of progression of the signs start from there. So you just take a KOH swab from the nose and you can get a result in about 30 minutes. So discoloration of the middle terminate I've seen in a uh, few patients. Okay, okay, agreed, I agreed, Dr. Suman. Any uh, any more comments from the uh, panelists? Yeah, Ravi, uh, I, I Ravi? have a question. I have a question. Ravi, yes, yes, sir, yes, sir, Dr. Yeah. Rathod, sir. Uh, actually, this uh, I want to add we have seen the cases who are more advanced. In right. early, early stages, means suppose some patient is at, at the home and he wants to know about uh, what are the problems. I want to comment that the type of the nasal stuffiness, type of nasal stuffiness changes when there is a sinus infection. And there is a mucor mycosis because it is endandritis and there is a bone destruction with mucor. So it is more permanent and it is more damaging. Second thing is regarding smell. Smell actually goes in, we know in COVID it goes. But when this mucor reappears on this patient, then patient is complain, complains of cacoxmia. So these are the some home things okay. which we can tell to the patient. Right. Otherwise, uh, I think uh, our panelists have covered very well. Right, sir. Yeah, right. Dr. Uh, Gautam, you wanted uh, to uh, add, uh, sir. Dr. Gautam. I don't want to add. I want to ask a question. You know, how many of you have seen fever, fever along with sinusitis as one of the presenting features of this case? Any any panelists? Oh, sir. We have, there is a, if you search the literature, it says, it says that um, constant fever is a feature of mucormycosis. Yeah, yeah, but, exactly. but, but yes, we have done about 8 to 10 endoscopies in the last 2-3 days. 
uh, fever has not been a symptom in, in, in fact, any one of that's them. That's what I wanted to highlight. You know, when I, I also realized uh, this when I studied back, then I came to know that, I mean, the books tell you, I mean, there's a bit traditional teaching yeah. that if you have a patient of sinusitis coming to you with fever, then you must rule out mucus. And believe me, you know, when we spoke, I went back to all my patients because it did tell fever, which we did not record. And I realized that most of these patients, they tell you that even after getting cured with COVID, they had a bout of fever along with their sinusitis. And they were told that, okay, it's an upper respiratory tract infection, you don't worry about it. Even I did not take, I mean, the patient did come with the history, but we did not like, you know, uh, mine knows what, uh, I see what mine knows. But when I was reading back in the book, then I realized that most of these patients, they have post-COVID fever also. Okay, maybe Ravi. for a day, maybe for a two, but yeah, most of them, yeah, if you ask them about the history, they, they, they do tell you that yes, they had fever and they did take Calpol for it. They did take paracetamol for it. They did seek a consultation for it. And their doctor told them that COVID is not going to be You take this medicine. And you will be done. Ravi, okay, uh, Ravi. Doctors, yes. Ravi, yes, the patient may have even dryness or itching or crusting in the beginning to begin with. Uh, what all uh, Dr. Sumit said, I agree yes. to that, but there may be even dryness and that could be attributed to the oxygen, but dryness and itching, uh, which is unusual and that may be the uh, earliest sign to start with. Dr. Ravi, uh, okay, yes, Dr. Shashi. I, I would tell three confounders which are going side by side. Glucocord nebulizations are also giving oral candidiasis, which is coming common and which also gives a reddish and swollen gums picture. Uh, then the pus can actually cause preceptal cellulitis, which we have seen at least four patients where we thought mucor and it turned out to be preceptal cellulitis. And two of them even got operated for FES and then we realized it's not mucor. Third is aspergillosis. A lot of times we go for a mucor and there's also a aspergillosis which is coming. And in one patient, we actually saw a perfect broth of pus, aspergillus, and candida and mucor, all three appearing together. So it's very important that we send all three of them, biopsy, KOH, and pus, all in a go, rather than just doing an nasal endoscopy and just doing a KOH and missing the other two. Right. Thank you for the uh, comments. I think uh, mucor, if you want to diagnose early, it is very important that uh, the endoscopy is done. As told by Dr. Sumit, we must do a nasal endoscopy to see for the nasal mucosal changes, which are the earliest sign. And if they are a crust, uh, then obviously you need to, uh, to remove them and take uh, a biopsy and uh, uh, further uh, send the specimen for diagnosis, confirming the diagnosis. That's always yeah. a problem when patient is RT-PCR positive because the yes, GA will not is... be given and he'll be breathing and uh, on your face uh, that's a very difficult so we'll, thing. We'll, we'll discuss about this uh, later in how to manage in a COVID positive patient. Right. So, the, Ravi, Ravi, yes, uh, Dr. Uh, I, I just, I just to... have one comment. Uh, yes, yes, Dr. Whitman. Yes. yes, go ahead, Dr. Whitman. I, I just have one comment uh, that uh, it, is, it is important to take the biopsy from the, the, with, the, with the help of a nasal endoscope. Well, one of the panelists was saying that we just swab it. So I, I believe the swabbing of the nasal uh, secretions will give always give you false negatives. So always go for some material and send it for KOH mount. Dr. Vipin, I said a patient having a change in the color of the mucosa of the middle terminate and there was a pus and little fungus from the middle meatus. So take a swab from that, not from the nasal mucosa. If okay, you can okay. see any pus or discharge, just take it. And uh, we checked with our microbiologist if you just take a swab from the nasal mucosa, uh, there are reports which say that uh, mucor may be a commensal, but it does not grow because it is in very, 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 very low quantity. The spores are there in the environment, especially in dry and dusty weather. But if there is, if you take it from a discharge or a pus, and if there is mucor, the KOS staining is the fastest way to establish diagnosis because you may not have a tissue for biopsy at that point of time. Asha, okay. Okay. Uh, I think we, we will go to the uh, doctor. Uh, Kapil, is there any uh, comment from your side? No, sir. I was, I just wanted to highlight a practical problem. Most of the patients, they are nowadays uh, uh, putting forth their complaints and uh, issues on teleconsultation. So yes. we, uh, we are labeling it as mucorphobia also. 
I have personally received a lot of uh, uh, tele consults in last few days yes. that I am I am having maybe facial heaviness or headache or maybe fever or nasal discharge. So uh, and nasal endoscopy, as uh, someone highlighted, it 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 is difficult in in current scenario because you have to get the patient in proper environment and uh, and uh, of course get their PCR. Some of them might be getting it. Some of us might not. So how are uh, panelists dealing with this particular? Uh, issue because you will call the patient. Okay, I have to see you uh, if 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 he is presenting with these issues. And uh, of course, do you tell them to get a PCR, come to you, and do nasal endoscopy, or how are you uh, dealing with it? Yes, Manish. because it is it is very difficult to sort on uh, on uh, any consults. I am running a twelve to three o'clock uh, OPD in Gangara. I am just not commercially talking, but I am running a OPD for twelve to three. It's a uh, OPD where I'm calling every patient who has a possible problem just for muca. I have a microbiologist sitting in the next room. We are getting KOH uh, done in a matter of minutes. And if we have a negative KOH, we are repeating it again. And we are making sure if we have a muca, we do it within half an hour, even three times. If you have to do a KOH, we are doing it. That's a great uh, point. You are also, sitting with PP. Uh, you yes, are considering that patient yes, as positive, yes. and you are just exclusively seeing yes, suspects. With the absolutely, view. absolutely. Second, I'm not insisting on an RT PCR, but I am asking them to tell me whether they had when were they COVID positive, and if they are beyond three weeks, I do do, do take a chance. Uh, you can say because I do believe that they are beyond the viremia stage. We have to help them. There's no other way. Secondly. We have an oculoplasty surgeon now sitting in the next OPD also in the same time. We are getting an eye examination, a KOH stain, a my, uh, this thing, all in a matter of half an hour of every patient. So they are told whether they have a mucor or not in half an hour. And then, of course, most of them have a, many of them do bring a radiology like a MRI or something which is already pointing out to the condition. The, it is then left to just the counseling, what needs to be done next. That is the problem. Most of them do not have a RT-PCR report, uh, which is uh, the mandatory requirement for hospitalization. So uh, we have to get that thing. We are getting that biofire RT-PCR done, which gives a report in three hours. We have limited kits for that. But as soon as we get that, you're right. It is giving more of positive than negative. I don't know. I have a feeling. But whenever it does, uh, we have now, thanks to the management of Gangaram, two wards dedicated to mucormycosis. And one ward is a COVID mucor ward and one is a non-COVID mucor ward. So uh, total, uh, we've got that beds. Uh, there are no free, uh, the beds are not uh, available right now because they're all full. But uh, wherever we can accommodate, we are pay there is a non-COVID emergency, there's a COVID emergency. We are making sure each one gets the first shot of 50 milligram of amphomal on the or the amphotericin liposomal in the first uh, one hour of presentation whenever we do that after that we have to tell them either you go somewhere if there's no bed or we are trying to accommodate them if they want to stay in the next two days one day but of course surgeries are getting delayed we are doing eight to nine cases of debridement every day but the thing is uh, um, the mucor, uh, the COVID positive debridements are done after 3 p.m. and before them 9 to 3, we have to do all the non-COVID mucor debridements. Okay, so okay. thanks, uh, thanks Manish for input. Uh, uh, any other comment from the panelists regarding the early diagnosis? Or we go ahead. Can I, uh, can I say something here, Dr. Ravi? I'm Jyoti this side. Yes, yes, Dr. Jyoti. Yeah, so uh, I would like to grab this opportunity to kind of, you know, point towards the diagnosis of, uh, towards the utility of CT um, for an early diagnosis. So we okay. have a few early so red I think Dr. Jyoti, we will be having a CT uh, radiology uh, slide just after a few minutes. We can discuss the radiology at that time. I can sure wait. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jyoti. So uh, what is the, what are the investigation required for confirming the diagnosis, Dr. G.B. Singh? Dr. G.B. Singh, please uh, switch on your mic. Most of it has already been discussed here. Right. We already have discussed here. So, you know, if you go, there's only, see, you know, you have to do an endoscopy. There is no way out of it. You have to take a swab. You have to send for KOH. But yes, you also have to take a biopsy specimen. 
I mean, we we are a center for fungus here in Lady Harding, and our microbiology department is very clear about it. And uh, even if we don't find something, we take a middle turbinate biopsy and always send it. Although, uh, you know, the thing is that you know, if you go, like Dr. Alok Thar told us that even on a mere suspicion of uh, uh, you know mucormycosis, you can start empotericin B. So it's not that you know you are waiting, and of course, a CT scan. The doctor, your radiologist, wanted to comment upon that. Uh, radiology complemented by uh, the endoscopy and biopsy. Of course, biopsy for fungus is a gold standard. There is no replacement for that. I mean, that is something right. which, as academicians, we all have to understand. But the kind of the disease that we are dealing with, that like Dr. Alok sir told us, that on a mere suspicion also, I believe under the present circumstances, we should initiate empotericin B for the treatment. Right. Well taken. A point well taken. Uh, any other comment from the panelist? So we can move to the next slide. Radiology. Uh, one small little comment. Uh, yes, what if yes. the what if the KOH is positive in the first ten minutes? Do you still even after the... that? Even after that, we we go for biopsy. We go for okay. biopsy, but we start treatment. I told no, you. No, sir. But let let me tell you a practical is... problem. A biopsy would require a in yeah, some yeah. Cases, seven in days. Some cases. No, no, not the time period. Biopsy when you do in an OPD. Does induce? No, no, no. We don't do in the OPD. You know, our problem is that we are not doing all our cases in the OT because oh. COVID positive, COVID negative. Okay. We do an endoscopy not in the OPD. We okay. are not doing endoscopies in the OPD at all for any COVID patient. If he's COVID negative, even then he goes to the OT. If he's COVID positive, even then he goes to our OT. So, oh. so I we don't discriminate it's positive or negative. Anybody it comes to the OPD gets it done. No, uh, no. Any suspicious case, we <laughs> has to. He has to go for an endoscopy and uh, our aim we are all PPE kit and we take all the So we are in the OPD with the PPE kit. The so second point is band imaging has been useful a little bit in delineating the area where you want to take a biopsy because the vascular pattern completely changes. Uh, so if you if you have a store system or a Olympus system, you can go to Spectra uh, Chroma A uh, in store system uh, in the HD. And you can actually see the blue bluish normal pattern, and suddenly in the even before the color change, you can actually see that uh, the pattern changes uh, in NBI, and that helps you do it. Interestingly, Actually, uh, I think uh, all of us not are, are not having NBI, but uh, yes. definitely uh, for early diagnosis because uh, it is mucor mycosis, which is a very aggressive disease. We need to have yeah. an early diagnosis, and there's a uh, importance of having a KOH mount. Yeah, where yes, you want to right. take that a is very biopsy. very important. Where you want to take a biopsy, uh, it it may just give you some hint, which some is some hint, definitely, biopsy. definitely, yeah. definitely. So yeah, there I is a role of NBI, but uh, obviously we, uh, everybody is not having the facility of NBI at disposal. Yeah, there were there was one thing publication about, uh, where methylene blue was used, like a supravital staining. The okay. dead tissue does not take up the methylene blue, whereas the live tissue takes up. I haven't tried that to be honest, but. When when everything looks normal and you still have to take a biopsy and you face uh, that challenge, where do I take a biopsy? The Definitely, NBI... then these, these things can help. Yeah. Right. Ravi, the problem is that if you take a biopsy, I mean, the good thing about the biopsy is that if you take a biopsy, then even sometimes you do get aspergillus. It doesn't turn out to be mucus. Right. That's what I wanted to emphasize. And then immediately you stop empotericin B and you shift your patient to triodes. There have been one or two odd cases with us. We were very sure about it. But, uh, but Dr. Gautam, in present scenario, what yeah, we are I mean, seeing is actually I said. Nee, nee, is, I said uh, that the all investigations is not seen. I don't yeah. think any of the panelists has uh, like uh, I mean having uh, uh, maybe there is a mixed infection, but it is predominantly uh, mucor. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It is even a slight important that we diagnose it at the earliest. In, in slightest of suspicion, in, 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 and we do a KOH mount, and if it is positive, then we should start the treatment, and we should not delay the treatment. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Ravi, Ravi, I wish to make. Yes, yes, Doctor Vipin. Uh, Ravi, uh, see, I'll I'll tell you the real uh, clinical scenario. We get a patient who is uh, suspicious to be suffering from mucormycosis. We take a small piece and send it for KOH mount. The report that comes is that they'll tell you that it is an aseptic hyphae. Branching, non-branching. They'll say you non-branching, aseptic or maybe partly septic hyphae. So in that case, there's no additional benefit of, of for the patient to undergo any further procedure for diagnosis. It has to be immediate treatment. 
Right. We, we treat that patient as to be suffering from mucormycosis and start immediate treatment. Right. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely agree, Dr. Vipin. Biopsy we send when we are debriding these patients, we send the entire material for biopsy, but it usually doesn't add anything to the diagnosis. Sir, in this right. forum, we should also highlight the importance of taking swabs properly. They should be taken from most representative and most unhealthy area possible. And if possible, we can uh, just remove the crust with underlying uh, debris and uh, also uh, sample them. For right. And it should be, a, it is said that it should be a deep uh, swab, not a superficial, just touching the mucosa is not sufficient. You have to actually rub it over the, uh, the yes, sir. So area my, so that yes, you have a representative uh, sample, right? Yes, sir. Uh, Ravi, Ravi, Ravi. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, it is not even deep. It is active area. It means it should be from the active area, okay, not from right, the necrotic right. portion. Yes, sir. Yes. Suppose sir. it is deep and necrotic. What will what will you get? Nothing. Right. Okay. So next we come to the radiology. So we can have comments from uh, Doctor Radiology, uh, Doctor Jyoti first, or Doctor Somit. You want? I think Dr. Jyoti wanted Dr. to make a comment. Dr. Yes, Sumit, uh, Dr. Sumit can go first, I think, and then it'll be nice to hear your viewpoints yeah. first, and then I'll take it from Ajay, there. Okay. So, Dr. Sumit, what do you yeah. offer to the patient? CT or MRI or both? And why? Dr. Ravi, many, many patients, in fact, walk to the OPD with a CT scan where they have got this uh, phobia of having a mucormycosis because the media has sensationalized it in the last week. And we do see, uh, like I uh, told you, we have seen about 15 to 16 patients with unilateral sinusitis and we do uh, nasal endoscopy. Now, fortunately, most of the patients, what we are getting in our OPDs are, are in the third week of their symptomatology of COVID. And uh, we, we expect a very, that either they are RT-PCR negative or the virus replication will be at the lowest phase because the virus stops replicate on the 10th day. Now, a CT scan would show just a unilateral sinusitis. Dr. Alok Thakkar really mentioned very nicely that CT scan should not be taken as a uh, coordinator to be the severity of disease. Sometimes patients with lot symptoms may have a very, very minuscule on the CT findings. Now, if you see a unilateral sinusitis and the symptomatology fits into a mucor, the patient is post-COVID, has taken a lot of steroids, I would go for an endoscopy and get a nasal swab done if there is a, a representative area and do a KOH. If on KOH, it comes out to be mucor. Like Dr. Munjal said, we also have our microbiologists with us and we get results in about approximately one hour. If these patients are planned for any surgery, for any debridement, then I would definitely uh, get an MR done with gadolinium enhancement. And before even we get that, we admit the patient and start the patient on liposomal amphotericin B. Now, why, why the need to get an MRI done with gadolinium enhancement? Because in soft tissues, the disease is angioinvasive. Once it spreads into the blood vessels, through the blood vessel, it, it causes thrombosis. It goes into from the PNS into the orbit, can go into the cavernous area. You need to distinguish if you want to debulk this patient. Now, an area which, will, which you will miss is a pterygopalatine fossa or an infratemporal fossa where the soft tissue you will not be able to differentiate on CT scan. Now, since it's a dead tissue, the MRI will not show any enhancement on it. So if you leave that fungus and you keep on giving amphotericin B to that patient, it will not be suffice and the patient will not improve. So MRI stands out, especially the T2-weighted images and the fat separation images, because if it goes into the orbit, you are planning for an orbital excentration. It is going into the orbital apex and finally to cavernous sinus. You need to look at the fat separation images and where an MRI plays a key role. So MRI is important in spread of disease from paranasal sinus to orbit and to the brain and also in identifying and delineating the site if you are doing a surgical debridement. My question is, Dr. Sumit, so first, if the patient comes, you will offer a CT scan or an MRI? Sir, so I will offer both. One patient I'll, comes to the OPD I and he get, does not have any radiological investigation. I will get both. I will get both depending, so upon, the, depending upon the status of the disease. If it's an early mucor, the signs have not come in and the patient uh, is there, I would just isolate because there are many cases of acute sinusitis where patients are coming with suspicion of mucor, but they are just acute sinusitis. So okay. a CT scan would just show a uh, sinusitis in the maxillary area. You give that patient antibiotics, you, you wait and watch and be and keep the patient in your loop so that the, how the patient is improving. 
Now, if right. you take these patients where the symptoms go beyond the level of sinusitis, there is a paresthesia of the trigeminal nerve, there is a reduced sensation, there is heaviness in the eyeballs, there is heaviness in the cheek, then definitely you know that it is not just simple sinusitis. And you have a history of a patient recovered from COVID, has used uh, steroids. So definitely you should then get an MRI. Right. Okay. Agreed. Any other comments from the panelist? Or we go to Dr. Jyoti for her expert comments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ravi, for uh, yeah. Dr. Thank Jyoti. you, Dr. Ravi, for having me here. And um, um, it has been a wonderful uh, experience to hear all the clinical viewpoints here. It's been a great learning experience, I must say. And uh, what I understand from this discussion here is that there are two questions on hand: number one, early detection, and yes. number two, extent of the disease. So. Um, we have always, like as Dr. Alok sir also said, and Dr. Sumit has been mentioning that what we see is just sinusitis on CT, one-sided maybe, and that's the end of the story that we can pick up on radiology. Now, what I would like to point out is that um, I agree that uh, it is a topic which is um, not very, um, like not all general radiologists are familiar with interpretation of the early signs. But there have been recent publications, and in fact, I also went through a lot of them when I saw a few cases in the last wave. That is where my interest spiked. And I was, I was wondering why in 10 days, three cases of invasive fungal sinusitis, that was last year. And then I went through a lot of publications and I realized that non-contrast CT has a major role to play in early detection of invasive fungal sinusitis. And... Um, there are studies which have shown um, that it may be more sensitive and has greater predictive value, even greater than MR in early detection. A non-contrast CT suffices as long as we are not expecting extension into the orbit or brain. Once that happens, the story becomes slightly different. However, in early disease, there are, there are certain sites which have been described, subtle sites, which you have to really actually look for. And we need to teach our radiology fraternity also to pick up these sites of infection. There are small sites like, you know, pre and retro fat. There are uh, involvement of pterygopalatine fossa, involvement of nasolacrimal duct, involvement of nasolacrimal sac, apart from orbit and brain, involvement of sphenopalatine formin, and there has been a beautiful article in uh, AJNR, which is a very respected radiology article, American Journal of Neuroradiology, which has shown us that pres out of these seven sites that they have mentioned in their article, presence of two sites positivity on a non-contrast CT has a 100% sensitivity and predictive value for early detection of invasive fungal sinusitis. Now, I'm not here to sell CT. We have already had, have had a major controversy over you know, rampant use of CT chests for COVID. But uh, what I would still like to believe is that CT can certainly help more than it is currently believed to be. And that is how the, when, when I read all this literature last year, and that is when, you know, we were supposed to give our thesis topics at that time. And that's when we began working on invasive fungal sinusitis oh. as a thesis. And we have done about, about oh, yeah. 50 cases of acute invasive fungal sinusitis in the last one year. I have found this uh, CT model as described by in this article in AJNR in 2015, very, very useful for early pickup. Even when the uh, clinical picture, um, the, when the requisition form has only said orbital cellulitis to us, because that was the early COVID days when everybody was very scared and maybe at the resident level, it was difficult to really interpret the findings on clinical examination. The patients were probably not examined as well as they should have been. And the requisition form just said orbital cellulitis. And our, our resident also report, was reporting it as orbital cellulitis. But that's when uh, we intervened and we realized that, no, this is not just plain orbital cellulitis. Please, you know, uh, uh, ring a bell for your clinician that, yes, it may be acute invasive fungal sinusitis, AIFS, and that's what it looks like. And um, we have had a lot of success in early detection of AIFS with a plain non-contrast CT. Yes, for extent of disease, when we are expecting disease to involve the orbit or brain, contrast enhanced CT or MR may be required. 
especially for cavernous sinus involvement, MR is certainly more useful. But then uh, we'll have to balance how many investigations can a patient really go through. Right. And uh, when we um, play on our uh, consoles with our window settings, it is not so difficult to pick up even cavernous sinus thrombosis and your brain involvement and orbital apex involvement even on CT. So um, we have, I agree that uh, even radiology fraternity needs more, um, you know, um, sensitization to the uh, uh, methods available and this, and we are holding seminars uh, in radiology fraternity also to really teach our residents and pick up this early, um, early disease. But uh, um, especially in the COVID scenario, when you have a difficulty in really examining the patient oh, and yeah. putting them through biopsies and stuff, if that, that's an issue, then radiology can really, really help you there. Right. Any questions, I'll be most I mean, welcome. Definitely, to definitely. Uh, very uh, excellent points, uh, Dr. Jyoti. And I would definitely like to read that uh, article. Uh, where you have uh, this uh, initial early signs on CT, right? And uh, maybe uh, if you can, uh, I mean, if you have some slides on. Uh, mm. Early, uh, uh, if you like to have a look at the early signs which you told. I so, I'm not uh, I wasn't prepared to carry my slides any, here. Okay, no issues. Because, no issues. Uh, what really you can do, you can time, just uh, yes. And especially uh, as as someone really raised the point that contrast may be an issue at times in these patients. So non-contrast CT is uh, is also immensely immensely beneficial. We really don't need to do a contrast unless right. we're expecting orbit and brain involvement. Right. Thanks. Thanks for the expert comment. I think, Dr. Jyoti, we can uh, I mean, share the uh, the journal, the article which you uh, mentioned to our members of Delhi OI. Yeah, yes, I, Dr. Will Dr. Uh, I will type it in the chat box. And, right. Uh, yeah. right. Right. Dr. Jyoti, right. I, mean, uh, uh, I mean, just to ask that you could re-emphasize, uh, I mean, where we are facing a problem in our management is not uh, the early detection of mucor CTs. We, we, are, we are having good methodologies to detect it and radiology forms a little bit of the second thing. But where we are actually facing the problem is when they, we are about to surgically manage these patients, uh, especially coordination between the eye surgeon and the uh, this thing, you, know, you have an orbital apex syndrome and you have a situation where you have to do a surgery. So we are all ready for nasal deprivement, but the ophthalmology surgeon always insists, get a MRI done, then I will tell you whether the you have to remove the eye or you have to just do the debridement. And there is a, an irritable uh, time oh, exactly. because COVID patients take a lot of time in getting MRIs done, especially the ones who are positive. So can you just give a point whether uh, a, a quick CT can tell us more accurately what are the points in the orbital um, uh, fat and um, medial rectus and cavernous sinus, these things. These are two, three points. If you can tell me if they can be picked up on CT to decide on orbital excentration, then we can re really take this forward with our eye colleague. And uh, Jyoti uh, ma'am, Jyoti ma'am, uh, just to put uh, this question in perspective, actually uh, there are other reasons for patient to turn blind. It might be direct uh, arterial occlusion, or uh, maybe retinal artery occlusion because of intravascular spread of fungus. So, do you see patients where uh, radiologically you don't see orbit is much diseased, but patient still is blind? Okay, so that theoretically is possible, but Dr. Kapil, I really haven't uh, seen as many patients like that. As right. far as my experience goes, but uh, yes, theoretically it certainly is possible. But uh, my experience there would be limited. Right. And um, for cavernous sinus and orbital involvement, uh, Dr. Manish, we would um, like to have a contrast enhanced CT done. And uh, um, fat stranding may be seen on non-contrast CT also. But uh, involvement of uh, muscles, how much it has really gone invaded those muscles is all better depicted on CT and much better depicted on MR owing to its inherent soft tissue resolution. So if you have to take a big decision whether to go for orbital excentration or not, whether the patient has cavernous thrombosis or not, maybe to pick out of the two, MR would be a safer modality to pick. Certainly. Right. Uh, so uh, orbital excentration decision 
has been based in our institution based only on mri contrast which is sometimes difficult but has to be done especially in patients who are sick but we are following that that but that is a irritable thing in my mind when i am discussing it with an or uh, this thing but you are also saying that it might be required in the final go yeah definitely uh, manish so, i think so, mr is better for uh, decision making in orbital excentration so okay, that, that is a must i have a small question to ask uh, sometimes we will not do orbital excentration our oculoplastic surgeon puts a catheter there and gives ampo washes and then he ask a serial mri every third day that's true to, that's true to continue how long uh, they have to do ampo teresin b and that becomes extremely expensive throughout as in logistic issues and they're sometimes covid positive and you get only a limited sl sl uh, slot for covid positive patient so does it really change so much in two or three days uh, no. uh, the mri picture that you have to repeat the mri every two three days i don't really expect things to change over a couple of days again however uh, in my institution i have not had such requests so uh, i have limited experience there because i would like to ask my own clinicians here like whether like i have never received requests like this in our department so, so same, i really wonder same. whether it is <clears throat> sir may i can uh, we are not giving any intra or retro orbital amphotericin i don't think our uh, ophthalmologists uh, are giving really? this. yes sir yes sir uh, there, there are uh, already research that when you operate after you have done the face and you have removed the debride tissue then they are washings are given with amphotericin b not in the manner but they are not followed up with the uh, primary uh, with serial ce ct scan or mri they are not followed up with it because now disease is already diagnosed so you have to just treat it so you have removed the disease then you are giving the washings amphotericin b there is already so. yes. a literature is there so sir one there is some sir that is that is the, in the management part we will discuss later sir ne one more thing ravi I mean, yes, yes, ravi one thing that mri is important because you you can also see the additional brain infarcts which are missed we are talking about mucor only suppose the patient is having a brain infarct then the treatment suddenly changes to different so that has a better role to do right so right MRI. right so, sir ravi, couple just just ravi yes uh, we can just i ask, want to yes. ask uh, jyoti what the is the role of fusion part for mri for fusion mri or fat suppression mri, MRI. in this i think it has a big role to play to decide uh, the uh, orbital excentration uh, dr jyoti uh definitely sir fat suppressed and perfusion mr as you call it uh basically enhances our ability to see the enhancing inflamed tissue compared to an mr which is not fat suppressed and which has not been given contrast so all, both these techniques enhance our ability to uh, visualize the changes better improving our resolution of the study so certainly they play a role but with uh, uh, deranged kfts may be a problem that is the only uh, that is the thing that we need to be careful about if the patient is um, has deranged renal functions otherwise uh, con perfusion study con per contrast study as i would call it with fat suppression will be the best technique to evaluate the entire extent okay okay thank you very much uh, for the comments uh, i think uh, what we can summarize is that if you want to uh, diagnose early we can go for a, a ct scan non contrast as dr jyoti has said but again uh, that will be helpful to diagnose uh, uh, mucor from normal like uh, Uh, acute bacterial sinusitis so if you are suspecting that yes there is acute bacterial sinusitis or there is a mucor definitely this early uh, con non contrast ct can ct scan can help and if you want to have an extent to know the extent intra orbital extent uh, intra cranial extent soft tissue extent into the pterygoid fossa or the infratemporal fossa mri uh, is the investigation of choice we can go ahead with the next because we are having uh, less time now uh, what is the medical management uh, dr vipin you can just summarize it quickly we can medical management dr uh, vipin dr vipin your why uh, you please switch on your mic yeah amphotericin b uh, we are using uh, in our mucormycosis patients uh, it's a liposomal one which we are using 
uh, and uh, we start with the uh, test dose of, of liposomal uh, amphotericin B along with the renal function test and then uh, then subsequently uh, we give three to five milligrams of per kg uh, dose of liposomal amphotericin B and uh, Anything else oral, you know, other panelists want to add? Oral pos posaconazole also uh, has got a role in uh, the medical management, uh, but uh, we are giving it subsequently once a patient is is uh, is done with the uh, course of liposomal amphotericin. So as a standard stand stand down therapy, patient. you are giving? Pos posaconazole, yes, we are giving. Yes. So any, any other uh, comments from the uh, panelists? I I would just add yes. <clears throat> so, the tendency uh, to start. Oh, sorry. Sir, if you see, there are four formulations of amphotericin which are available in the market. I think, uh, Sumit, uh, that is the next question. We will come to the different formulation. We yes. just want to highlight the medical management. Dr. Sashi. And, and right. the trend was to start uh, Ampho and Posaconazole and it would go, give better results. There was only one publication, but a recent meta-analysis actually disproved it. Uh, amphotericin B, single liposomal, is actually equally good. So it only adds on to the cost. So it is, uh, you know, uh, posaconazole is to be reserved later. And if you are using uh, in severe CKD patients where amphotericin B cannot be given, then the IV posaconazole has to be given, not the oral one, because that's the mistake people do it. They give oral or the syrups. And uh, Ivaso, uh, isavoconazole is, is, is also a very good alternative uh, and we, we have only used for one patient uh, to salvage uh, the, when he had a disseminated one. Okay. Uh, sir, Ravi? Yes, Ravi, sir. One yes, question. Sir. Do, do you want to stage the disease before starting the treatment? Okay. Mm -hmm. So staging, uh, definitely uh, uh, we want to stage it. Uh, Dr. Manish, you were talking about some staging uh, yeah. which, you, which is there for uh, this rhino orbital <laughs> cerebral mucormycosis. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, um, is it possible to uh, what share the screen kind of a thing? Yeah. Or, or net, maybe not. I'll just, uh, just enumerate just what are the stages. Yeah. So, hello. Hello. Yes. Uh, just a minute. So, uh, uh, well, uh, we have done some uh, kind of it's a comprehensive treatment guideline, which is very open for discussion. I think what better forum than and all these people, you guys who can do it. Based on common clinical endoscopic and radiological parameters, we have tried to put uh, and uh, rather than the stage uh, four stages that have been uh, indicated for uh, uh, the the uh, what you call by uh, sir has been using the um, cutter stages. We have now I have tried to further elaborate it into five stages, and uh, in that also we have sub staged them. Like uh, we have done, done single subunit of nose rather than just uh, the um, the things we have divided into single subunit like inferior tablets. Very earliest mucor like SCHARS, floor of septum. One is mucosa only, two B is mucosa plus bone and cartilage going side the end. Then we have given a recommendation. It's not a hard and fast thing, but like fast total debridement, which can be even done at the uh, minor roti setup followed by a course of, uh, of course, IV antifungals or posaconazole as the situation might be. Then the stage is two is more than one subunit, which excludes lamina, papracia, and skull base. Two is two A is mucosa only. Two B is mucosa bone cartilage. Third is two C is bilateral involvement. They rec recommended is aggressive, extended local debridemental vascular mucosal edges are reached and concomitant antifungal therapy. Then involvement of lamina, papracia, skull base, it is unilateral 3A, bilateral or contiguous spread is 3 It's a comprehensive one. And the recommendation is pre-surgical loading with IV antifungals recommended for up to 48 hours, followed by endoscopic debridement and continuation therapy. Then stage four is minimum and extra nasal spread. It is, includes earliest is pterygopalatine, fossa, nasopharynx, then 4B is medial compartment of orbit apex without loss of vision and 4C is minimum meningeal involvement. It is also in, involving excessive uh, aggressive uh, therapy 
after giving um, uh, i mean excessive uh, debridement surgery after uh, loading those then four five is significant extra nasal spread where there is orbital involvement loss of vision yeah, yeah, then see. intracranial then gross infratemporal fossa neck space involvement where you you know you can prognosticate it and neurosurgical approaches can be added to it and uh, like maxillectomy and open surgery okay okay uh, i think uh, yeah. that is a very comprehensive uh, staging yeah. system i think so i have we, sent it to you and you can uh, send it to maybe the, i think we uh, we can we must yeah. have a I, i think it's a very comprehensive one we must have yeah. a simple a uh, simpler staging system yeah. for ease of use okay that is what my uh, yeah it can so, be made simpler yeah right. that is it. so uh, any any more comments about the medical management so i would yeah, summarize yeah, otherwise yeah, i i want to ask a question what is the cl- clinical significance of having a classification does it alter your treatment modalities basically uh, it is yes. to standardize the treatment to make yes. guidelines and have a standardized treatment what standardized treatment whether your case it's a case of early mucormycosis or it's a case of you know involving the skull based mucormycosis the treatment protocol yes. remains the same you have to treat your patient with amphotericin no, b you have of... to control the debilitating right. factor and the third thing is the surgery the surgery comes at the third level if you're having a classification it's got to have some clinical significance how does it alter Definitely. your prognosis and, and how does it alter your treatment uh, protocol i can answer i think it can help in giving the prognosis or no. guarded prognosis to the patient's relative you can tell the patient's attendant See, we have no standardized of... classification for mucormycosis or for that matter for any invasive fungi whether it's due to aspergillosis or it's due to muca rhizopus we don't have but we need to create one why no, Ravi, there is a need does it alter the course of clinical course or no, no, no. clinical treatment there is a need definitely ravi uh, yes there is a need it will uh, give you the prognosis the one who is having skull base is likely to um, whether it will make it or not but the early one will certainly so if they you can have a classification or the extent of the disease you right. can tell the prognosis to the relatives of the patient guys that i think it doesn't uh, change no, no. your treatment uh, rathod sir i will have just last comment on this uh, from I'll I'll sir dr rathod yes sir got there is a there is a need for this suppose you have a uh, bilateral cavernous sinus thrombosis and there is a disease going on to that place there you will always decide that whether you should operate or you should not operate sir cavernous sinus thrombosis is a, is a very so, fatal disease ah, hardly yes. any patient survives with cavernous no, sinus no, no, thrombosis no, no, no. i have not seen a single staging. case till date of any patient surviving cavernous sinus thrombosis no, 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 but you need staging i, I have seen three or four cases and they all have survived dr gautam let's so phone ka dr kapil on this and then we can sir i just want So, uh, I just wanted to summarize this, and Dr. Gautam is also right that we don't need to create an unnecessarily complex uh, uh, staging or classification. So, in our dashboard, we just keep it sinonasal, uh, intracranial, and intraorbital. We can call it sinonasal, sinonaso orbital, and sinonaso orbitocranial. So, there is some sort of classification you should yes. follow, right? That, yes. that is important because so that if, the, if the, the patient is likely to have nearly ninety percent mortality, right. the patient also deserves to know that what stage he is right. falling in. Right. So, for that purpose, so we, I think it is important to prognosticate and also to triage the patients accordingly. Definitely triage, cross yes. prognostication, as well as treatment, also uh, uh, the treatment strategies, also, right? So, it is important to have a classification, but uh, uh, it should be a simpler classification and uh plus it should be it is important so that the other surgeon treating surgeon can easily understand what is the stage of disease or what is the extent of disease right. we 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 so, made a staging in which actually the covid status is involved on oxygen dependence or not covid positive or not because post operatively where is going to be put does he need a ventilator or not are important decisions while you going to operate right. right so i think i will just summarize the medical management that the medical management is involves two thing one is to stabilize the blood sugar levels of the patient that is very very important the patient should be started uh, preferably on insulin so that he has a good control of blood sugar plus he should be started on amphotericin you don't wait for biopsy even a simple koh mount if it is positive for mucor you must start the treatment so empirical amphotericin b can be started earlier we never used to start empirical uh, amphotericin b uh, we used to wait for biopsy uh, but in present scenario it is very very important that we diagnose them early and start the management early so that the patient mortality and morbidity can be reduced uh, second thing is that uh, we have to start the amphotericin b uh, liposomal amphotericin b is 
uh, good enough uh, that is the first line of management uh, which should be there if the patient is sensitive to liposomal amphotericin b or he is uh, having kidney function or renal derangement then obviously we, the second line treatment can be isovacanazole iv right so we'll come to the next slide that is what are the different types of amphotericin b formulations are available and what are the difference in efficacy side effects and complication dr sumit please uh, so dr ravi there are actually theoretically four uh, formulations of amphotericin which are available in the market three are the lipid formulations whereas one is a non lipid formulation the most uh, cheapest one is a uh, amphotericin b deoxycholate which is the most basic one and is the most toxic one because uh, because it generally goes and binds to the lipoproteins also but but then uh, you know where where patients don't have access to other lipo uh, other amphotericin b deoxycholate is used but deoxycholate comes with a heavy price of uh, severe renal toxicity and the gfr reduces and uh, in patients who have an underlying renal disease it should not be used the other three formulation that is amphotericin b colloidal dispersion or amphotericin b lipoidal complex or amphotericin b liposomal that is all three they are far better in terms of their renal toxicity but the best one to use it with less allergic reactions less infusion reactions uh, better tolerated by a patient where a cumulative dose about 3 to 5 gram can be given over a period of 6 to 7 days is liposomal amphotericin b right And you may not need to adjust this in case of uh, renal uh, problems because majority of the metabolism is through the hepatic areas and uh, rightly mentioned as uh, shashi said if a patient has already uh, has a very poor renal function and he should uh, he can be provided with an iv isoconazole or an iv posaconazole now if a patient may not be able to get for admission and may cannot afford or cannot have access to because amphotericin b is already is only a parenteral drug it is not an oral drug so you don't have access then a delayed release posaconazole is preferred over an oral suspension of a posaconazole so these four formulations are there in the market the basic amphotericin b deoxycholate is the cheapest and the liposomal is actually the per day treatment is very expensive it will cost somewhere about 35 to 40000 per day right so uh, uh, well taken all the points dr sumit uh, there are different formulations available and i specifically uh, put this slide because of the fact that we are having shortage of amphotericin b so in the resource constrained environment where we don't have the amphotericin uh, liposomal amphotericin b we might have to give uh, amphotericin deoxycholate which is the cheaper version available but it has a nephrotoxicity and that must be told to the patient pre uh, i mean pre therapy that is the very very important point uh, which but sir colloidal and lipoidal are also equally good in terms of efficacy and less renal toxicity and they are not that expensive and uh, they they are still available in the market uh, to be told to the patient very clearly prof yes but again the problem of availability is an issue yes. and uh, one important point which i wanted to bring out is the fact that these uh, uh, um, like uh, this amphotericin also causes hypokalemia right so we must monitor the potassium levels of the patient and uh, we must supplement potassium uh, orally right and uh, another point is the kft we have to monitor the kidney function test and in case there is a, a deranged kidney function test the creatinine uh, uh, levels almost double then you might have to stop the drug maybe you can have to give 2 3 days of rest and then restart the drug pre therapy hydration with saline is very very important right so that must be also uh, done sir one more important point that patients who are on corticosteroid should be made to taper off very fast because corticosteroid induces hypokalemia in this patient which is further aggravated if they are on amphotericin b right and uh, other indi other uh, drugs like aminoglycosides or cyclosporine or uh, it should be stopped should be stopped because then the cumulative renal toxicity is quite high Uh, what about then, antibiotics how frequently uh, other people prescribe it along with yes. the amphotericin b intravenous antibiotic intravenous antibiotic says any any panelist would like to comment on this sir, sir our most common uh, can i sir yeah, yes yes please. yes dr kapil please so go ahead most common modality of diagnosis although it was debated a bit is uh, uh, mucosal uh, swabs the nasal swabs 
I would say the positivity rate in strong suspicion is almost 50% in our experience. And awaiting that, we start them amphotericin. But sometimes you have a clinical suspicion that there is a super added bacterial infection or it is not fungus. As Shashi had rightly mentioned, we are getting some patients where it is actually not a fungal sinusitis, but a pyogenic sinusitis manifesting with orbital complications. In those scenarios, we are like, we are also giving uh, uh, antibacterial antibiotics along with antifungals. If it is proven and we have ruled out uh, the sinusitis, we we uh, withdraw those antibiotics and we stop them uh, in, in most okay. circumstances. We are preferring clindamycin and augmentin uh, because yeah. clindamycin is very nephro-safe and same. covers the anaerobic as well. That's same. just a point. Exactly the same. Yes. Right. Clindam and one, and uh, one more important point regarding amphotericin uh, uh, administration is that it is to be given in dextrose. So if you are giving it in dextrose, it has to be neutralized by insulin. So in neutralizing drip uh, is important because otherwise it will shoot up the sugars. Ravi? Ravi? Yes, sir. Uh, this uh, even insulin will cause hypokalemia. So you you can you can yes. understand the biochemical marker. It will be tested frequently, almost on daily basis for such cases. Right, sir. Right, sir. Point well taken, sir. Uh, so next is the prophylaxis. Doctor J B Singh would like to talk you about the prophylaxis. Any drug which is which can be used, or we should use prophylaxis in these patients of uh, COVID or not? See, you know there is no drug. Uh, for prophylaxis. The only right. prophylaxis for COVID patient is number one, you know, the use of uh, steroids. I was talking to our uh, physicians. They were saying that the British medical people, they have a national health service and all. They have put a strict guidelines that they, they don't give steroids unless the patient requires oxygen. They're very clear about it. And right. in 220, they have published also, they gave me the publication also, which says that if your patient is being put on any non-invasive ventilation or any proper uh, uh, this ICU, only then they start their steroids. But we are, of course, as Dr. Alu told, everyone is using steroids. So we are having, we have to be very strict about that. We have to be very vociferous. We have to tell people that we are not to misuse steroids. Okay, okay. Uh, any, any comments from the panelists? And the second regarding is prophylaxis. So Lancet had a publication, global recommendation for uh, starting posaconazole in high risk individuals. Uh, very debatable. Uh, very debatable. Present. Very debatable. And, and you know, could... posaconazole has not been approved by the uh, U US department. It's a drug which is so rampantly being used in India. It's not at all. In fact, what they are using for this is uh, isobucunazole. Mm -hmm. So ICMR publication also says posaconazole. Uh, in high risk population, uh, but I, I never had the courage to recommend it to our. We are not uh, using it, and uh, I think we should uh, unless the guidelines are strictly formulated. We have some clinical trials. I think we have to stick to this. And second is of course the proper management of diabetes. And of course, as one of the panelists told, that if any patient post COVID has sinusitis, then he must immediately seek uh, ENP opinion. So, uh, so to but summarize. Yes, so Dr. Sir, Sumit. I just make a point. You know, uh, prophylaxis currently with the literature available, there is no role. And yeah. I think it's a very clear cut message. Let's not create a protocol of a prophylaxis. Otherwise, right. it right. will become short from the market. Even patients. See, let That's... me tell you one thing. All these patients who have rhino orbital or rhino orbital cerebral mucormycosis, they, they, the main aim is surgical debridement to get the fungus off from the body. Along with that, one week of amphotericin B, they can't stay in the hospital for three months to keep a continuous infusion of amphotericin B. Most right, of right. Them so, require, Dr. Sumit, you point. Most of them require three to six months of oral posoconazole after they have been discharged from the hospital. And trust me, if we if we promote this, then we are not going to get any oh, drugs. So this is, sir, this is sir. May I put in a point? Yes, yes, Doctor Smith. Doctor Smith, should we on this forum uh, uh, bring out this point that if we if we are likely to fall short of amphotericin, then we should be stopping in uh, amphotericin after two weeks and shift the patients on posaconazole, or should we sort of uh, tell the authorities or government that they should Dr. be? Doctor Kapil, there is a clear cut literature available which says that. If you have a patient who is diagnosed with uh, mucormycosis and if that patient needs surgery, debride the patient, remove the fungus because the because the outcome of giving IV amphotericin will be much better after the fungus removal, the dead tissue. 
the patient needs to take about 7 to 10 days when you reach the cumulative dose of amphotericin b that is liposomal 3 to 5 grams it can in some cases of rhino cerebral the cumulative dose can go up till 30 grams but, but even if we administer 200 milligrams per day our cumulative of 5 grams will take uh, quite some 20 time days. 20 days 20 days so yeah. but then but then but then it is about 5 to 10 milligram per kilogram per day for cerebral, the maximum dose tolerated is 10 milligram per kilogram per right. day. Beyond that, you will not aim any better CNS penetration. So my point is that, but for a complete cure, clinical cure, uh, symptomatology cure, patient will need oral posaconazole after the patient has received IV amphotericin B. So complete amphotericin B. That is not, uh, complete that is not to 5 gram dosage in rhino uh, or rhino orbital and 10 gram dosage in rhino orbital cerebral but and uh, after that step down on posaconazole and yes. continue as per the clinical yes. response yes right. yes, okay. yes. Okay. Right. Right. can i tell you how it goes actually in the so, practice we start with 200 go up to 350 stock is short we come back to 200 i have then seen again we go to 350 400 more than 200 patient has paralytic lesions because of hypokalemia then again we come down more than so 200 every day to tolerate uh, they, every day we are kind of playing around with the amphotericin dose and it's really funny like whoa, whoa. shashi shashi right. i just make a small point i just make a small point for all, for 5 all milligram 5 milligram per kilogram is a good dose to start with until yeah. you are suspecting a cerebral involvement then you need to step up and whatever dose you need to uh, give for amphotericin, please start on day one. Don't increase on a step ladder. So we, that we are doing the same thing. There yeah. are patients who are neurological employment receiving almost a 600 milligram a day. Sir, 5, and 5 milligram is would be 30, 300 milligram for a 60 individual. Yes. Uh, yes. It, so, for practically, if we are administering it, 300 yes. milligram is not an easy to, to tolerate. Uh, for it is not. It is not. Yes. So every day uh, you go up, down, you play around they will with have, the They will have challenges with the electrolytes. They will have challenges with creatinine. Kapil, and sometimes bone marrow suppression also. Kapil, that's a, uh, we are, we are no, giving, I think we, we are, are giving uh, 600 uh, milligrams to a patient with bilateral optic uh, orbital involvement and in, minimal intracranial extension after surgery. We are giving to three patients in the ICU intrathecal amputation also. <laughs> that yes, is going sir. on with extensive intracranial involvement. There's intrathecal also being given. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I think uh, we are uh, short of time. Uh, we, I will request uh, all the panelists to be quick and uh, 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 and speak uh, important points only. Right. So, uh, Doctor Vipin, you want to uh, tell us yeah. quick point? I think I think we have been discussed. Uh, we have been discussing about the conventional lymphotericin B and comparing it with the liposomal one. But, but, but let me clarify, these are two different uh, sort of formulations. So if we, the, the mechanism of action of these two is, is in, in the body, the pharmacodynamics is different. The conventional amphotericin B is accumulated in the fat. So that is, so there is a role of cumulative dose. So we, we say two grams, three grams of, but so it, we measure it in grams, but liposomal one is excreted by the kidney. So if we, so, so, so vis-a-vis -vis they are not comparable. So we should be using uh, for conventional amphotericin B, we should be using the uh, measure as in grams, but for liposomal, we should be measuring the total dose in number of days. This is my, so. Okay. okay so I think I will just summarize that uh, uh, there's no role of profile access. We, sh we should not, because what I am seeing is, I am seeing lots of prescriptions. In fact, I today only I received a WhatsApp prescription. Patient was started on fluconazole. So uh, just, uh, just to give any antifungal is not good. We should not uh, give any antifungal drug as a prophylaxis. We are sh having shortage of drug already. Uh, so we should discourage any prophylaxis for COVID patient just to prevent mucor further mucor development, right? Okay, uh, sir, Dr. Rathod, sir, what are the uh, pre-op counseling and consent? Like it is, uh, you will take before taking the patient for surgery. Counseling Hello. and consent, sir. Uh, uh, in this yes. post-COVID uh, COVID period, uh, we have to take a special consent from the uh, patient that because when you start operating this patient, after your uh, MRI and other investigations, then when you operate, then your decision may change. Suppose you are you are planning to remove only a pellet 
middle terminate but suddenly when you do not see a active end so you have to suddenly remove the medial orbital or wall also so this uh, always should be a part of your consent before right, and second thing is uh, w- w- uh, about the treatment portion we should always tell the patient in advance that what type of uh, anti uh, amphotericin is likely to get and what is the duration because they have to plan their activities accordingly patient right. we cannot uh, day to day basis we cannot tell that you keep on lying here for two weeks three weeks doesn't matter and one thing i want to suggest to uh, dr ravi that uh, as a as a office bearer of the delhi oi you should interact with the government that uh, the liposomal sufficient and protein should be available you right, should not vanish just like a remdesivir right, so sir. governmental control should start from now because mucor is coming I mean, likely to come in, in near future so right, we should be ready for your point is very taken and we will definitely write to government of delhi uh, as a office bearer uh, of delhi oi we will write to delhi government for uh, requirement of amphotericin b right any any uh, other comments from the uh, panelist regarding pre op counseling dr shashi please switch on your we mic. also explain that uh, amphotericin supply is not uh, uh, guaranteed we may we take consent for three surgeries that the surgery uh, will have a relook on fifth day and another uh, third look maybe on eighth or tenth day we we'll tell the patient priorly because it's never going to be a single uh, single surgery we also inform that there may be a change of plan during the surgery right. and all of this is video recorded for the simple reason uh, uh, it's a very sensitive issue for the patient when you go and tell them that the eye has to be removed and if they get any evidence that it was not required it creates such a big uh, confusion so please right all eye exenteration uh, counseling is done uh, under video Record. right that is very very important point because uh, eye is a uh, eye removal is a i mean very uh, traumatic experience for the patient psychologically and socially also so it is important that you have a proper counseling and uh, uh, consent for the same and it should be video recorded and i i, I uh, agree with dr shashi on that part any any other comment from the uh, audience or we uh, from the panelists or we go to the next slide okay so surgical management again uh, i would like dr shashi dar to please uh, elaborate on the surgical management and uh, practical tips for the surgical management so we uh, we have just done 19 till now another five are waiting uh, better people would be like aims and uh, dr gangaram team <laughs> they have done many more numbers but uh, the practical problems which we face is there's always a negotiation going on when you say this is what is required and then they say we don't want a total maxillectomy we want a partial and it's very difficult to convince them that you know uh, a complete uh, maxillectomy is required especially when the extent is in the pterygopalatine fossa and beyond so f- uh, for us uh, endoscopic surgery is like a privilege if you if you have a limited disease where only endoscopic can be done it's like a it's like a uh, candy for you but most of these would have like palatal involvement and they'll have uh, maxillary involvement which require much extensive now the problem comes more in terms of post op care as well and you have to think in three steps ahead when you are doing a surgery because they are mostly covid positive we are getting more of covid positive patients right now so someone has to go do the dressing and other things so we actually all maxillectomies and everything we do tracheostomy uh, then and there so that the patient's post op ventilator requirement extubation and all those risk is minimized uh, pack removals are done at least 5 days later because we uh, either put a betadine ointment or we put a uh, ampho gel uh, so that you know you don't have to do redo dr- uh, dressings and these are all patients who are dispersed in different places and very difficult to trace them they're not uh, centralized in our uh, hospital one is in a covid care one is in Uh, the regular ward and other things third is uh, you have to take implants uh, uh, the measurements <laughs> for the orthodontic and prosthodontic prior to the surgery and that's always a difficult part to uh, coordinate with the dental if you're doing a limited maxillectomy or inferior maxillectomy to actually take this with a covid positive patient so these are the three main considerations the only surgeries which we completely avoid 
is having intracranial extension with multiple thrombi. So we had two cases with stroke, uh, which had limited nasal disease, which you could have just gone and done a fess. Uh, I discussed with Dr. Manish Munjal and he gave a wisdom on that, that, you know, it's better to give a pass to them. In two days, they deteriorated. Their consciousness went down. They're on two uh, inotropes. So it's it's good to pass uh, because a lot of these stroke patients which are now presenting are actually mucormycosis with thrombotic events rather than pure stroke. And uh, so uh, the last, and th th that would be it. Okay, okay. Thank you for the... Uh... Comments, uh, Dr. Sumit, just quick comment. Yeah. Sir, I would say that uh, if we talk about surgical management, I would make it a uh, multidisciplinary team approach because most of the patients who require debridement will require not only an ENT, but require a plastic opinion and require an ophthalmologist to be there on the table if you're doing an enucleation or evisceration. As uh, Shashi mentioned, uh, you know, of course, uh, a dental uh, surgeon should be there. Uh, we need to counsel the patient regarding the requirement of post-op rehabilitation because most of some of them have got very bad disagreement and that okay, Sumit, we have we'll be having a discussion on post-op rehabilitation later okay. maybe you can just add a, a, something on surgical management Doctor, uh, sir, I, I would add one more department point. should Sorry. sit down and talk to the patient that what the patient would require maybe in subsequent surgeries I would right. add one more which is Dr. Okay. Manish had told me uh, Dr. Quick comment. Okay. Yeah, uh, Ravi, uh, I think uh, Shashi was about to mention that we I have found uh, doing uh, local treatments under local anesthesia <laughs> extremely useful. Especially, we have been able to save the uh, eyesight in uh, blurring eyes in at least five to six young individuals, thirty-one to forty years of age. And what we did was, uh, two or three of them were the third week COVID positives. RT PCR was positive. There, we all recognize the poor chest condition that these people have. It is very risky to give general anesthesia to uh, a fresh COVID patient, as we all know. So I okay. had a medial compartment pus. I had uh, um, um, uh, ethmoidal sinusitis and maxillary sinusitis and could see the pus under pressure. And five or six cases, we have done it. Yesterday, I did two or three cases. They had... Um, a deteriorating vision of 636 and it was an alarm two patients that did one after the other and they've come back by 6 by 18 vision and uh, i think uh, these are the emergencies right. also you have to recognize where the need for an urgent going in endoscopic can be also very vital but of course the advanced cases as sumit right. and uh, have uh, put in uh, and uh, just to make uh, the matters, uh, this thing, endoscopic debridement, the local, because of the pre uh, the nature of the mucomycosis, which desensitizes the nerves, is more easy than we think than doing a conventional test. So I've been very successful in doing it. Right. We, right. Sir, we are also following what you said. We also are doing under local and the anesthetist is also quite happy. And the patient doesn't feel much of pain because it's a devitalized area. And I think uh, the anesthetist is quite happy because most of them have got a very bad chest. Right. Right. So, uh, little the, piece uh, of advice. So, what? So, yes. So, little piece of advice when you do it, pack them nicely because once they go into the ward, somebody would start them on heparin and then you'll be rushing at night to repack right. them. And that has happened to me twice. So, we, we either say uh, withhold heparin for five days. Or we, we kind of pack it nicely and remove it only after five days. We right, are right. holding a parent for two days and then starting after that. So Right. That yes, doing. sir. Dr. Uh, Rato, quick comment, sir. Uh, Dr. Ravi, about this local uh, debridement, I have a caveat to say that uh, I was uh, doing in earlier this case uh, before the COVID. So because the bone is diseased, so bony trabeculase are not normal in this case. I was removing the bone by, by the ronger from the anterior wall of the maxilla because the bone is devitalized. So even posterior wall came out. So right, you know, right, there is always happen, a risk. Sir. There is always a risk. You you cannot titrate it that how much you are going to remove. So it, it should be uh, done with this careful. Uh, right. set. So what I can conclude is that uh, you, you need to uh, plan your surgery properly according to the extent you might have to do open approaches, uh, it is not always possible to go endoscopically and you should not hesitate to convert uh, it into open surgery like for mazelectomy or for clearance of the orbit, etc. And uh, local anesthesia, definitely, yes. Uh, 
you might be able to do some of the cases in local anesthesia uh, uh, especially in positive uh, covid patients right so dr kapil uh, how will you, uh, what is the management of i in muka dr kapil are you there so yes sir so some yes. things have already been discussed so, i will not be repeating that yes uh, as uh, uh, other panel short and uh, crisp yes. so i taking out i is a very major decision uh, patient uh, has to take into confidence before uh, undertaking uh, any such intervention uh, as dr thakkar mentioned in presentation first treatment for uh, mucor is medical so we we should look at starting amphotericin uh, it should not be our priority to just take out the eyeball there are other reasons beyond uh, direct orbital invasion or extension that can cause blindness important is vascular invasion and arterial uh, occlusion of uh, vessel supplying right. the eye So it is prudent to get ophthalmology evaluation both for ophthalmoplegia, proptosis, as well as for uh, for uh, fundus evaluation. Uh, I would uh, feel that if there is direct orbital extension, as demonstrated on um, MRI, we should uh, be uh, considering eyeball removal. But if if it's not, if the uh, eyeball is uh, involved because of other reasons, we can do. the deprivement of fungus and observe there is always a second time there is always a second chance if the patient is not improving uh, to your medical treatment and uh, uh, he is deteriorating then you can always go back take consent and uh, for removal of eyeball your next point is about the orbital apex involvement orbital apex involvement is a poor prognostic sign because it's the closest foramen to to cranial cavity uh, there is evidence that if the orbital apex is involved you can almost always be certain that disease is intracranial so it should be treated as intracranial rather than intraorbital disease retro orbital since you had sent me this slide uh, prior i had just went to retracher i don't have an experience but there are three modalities of injecting uh, uh, amphotericin in the eye one is intravitreous second is intraorbital and third is retro orbital according to literature i don't have personal experience on that uh, if given a chance i will probably involve the ophthalmologist in this uh, shashi was mentioning that uh, uh, serial mri is in evaluating uh, 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 the response to retro orbital in injection Uh, the literature that i went through is they evaluated uh, by serial fundus uh, proptosis and ophthalmoplegia evaluation rather than radiology so clinical improvement with this and some have reported that uh, it gives uh, good benefit but they are only anecdotal case reports maybe two series one series one case three cases and and so on so there is no very good abundant literature so treatment is amphotericin systemic if i is involved c whether there are clinical signs or symptoms of direct eyeball extension for example do you have put on a picture in upper uh, uh, photograph there yes, is yes. process uh, there is a lot of uh, chemosis there is a lot of uh, conjunctival congestion the eye is red so this this indicates that there is direct orbital invasion with fungus this eyeball probably needs to come out but if it's cavernous sinus disease because of that there is ophthalmoplegia as is possible in lower uh, uh, picture you need to be more careful and more uh, uh, sensitive in possibly preserving this eye and then going back later again in second sitting if uh, if your clinical situation warrants right so uh, so any other comments from uh, other panelists yes dr manish yeah absolutely i mean but uh, uh, as i said i mean leave the decision to the specialist it's the best orbital excentration we are keeping our hands up asking the ophthalmologists to give their decision Uh, most of the times when it is uh, the emergency it is we who are doing the running because we have to save the vision at most of the times and that's where the whole emergency of surgery comes in but uh, and and to support uh, uh, this retro orbital uh, injections in our institution at least are being given only in uh, pl pr negative individuals where cra has already uh, retinal artery has already set in they are not giving to people with vision so even uh, then they give it because they if they see no gross disease in the eye but they are suspect right. orbital apex they are doing it but of course once they see bulk disease they usually take a decision of removing the eyeball and then they do it with tandem with us that's how they do it it's not really that emergent once you are decide that you have to remove the orbital most of the surgeries are able to plan at one day one day but the endoscopic ones we are doing at two hour notices and this and that to save the vision if you have to do yeah so are you spacing them or you are doing concurrently that's right. the bigger question <clears throat> so whatever we do the 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 covid positives are to be done only after a particular time in the uh, day or you post them early in the morning right before the retino decide but the 9 to 3 or time is you or 4 or 5 it may extend is the sacrosanct time for non covid cases 
where in order of preference you will put the endoscopic single sided shortest cases which require your immediate attention so we are posting them like that and after that we are posting the non covid orbital excentration and all with with a little bit of planning that okay she will come the ophthalmologist will come at this time we'll we'll do the debridement first they will remove the eye second it usually takes about one and a half to two hours in such cases per case and uh, of course uh, when it comes to covid uh, positive cases they are even if they are losing eyesight i have not been able to help some of them it has to be done after the normal cases are done it's like that So okay, sir, some okay, of us you, are Dr. doing I think... excentations ourselves. Some of us are doing excentations ourselves. Uh, no, we are, we are not doing excentations ourselves. So we we do involve so, the ophthalmologist for for documentation and for that. Okay, it is go ahead uh, from our side. Yeah, you need an ophthalmoplastic unit. Yeah, if there is an ophthalmoplastic right. surgeon who is willing, uh, we do have uh, it. Couple, but, yes, Kapil, Kapil, Kapil. Yes, uh, we do involve ophthalmologist in decision making, but uh, we do our own excentrations. Once See, the decision right. is made, that that's do... what we are doing, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Same, uh, same, uh, Vipin and Doctor Kapil. Same thing we are also doing. Yeah. We involve the ophthalmologist in making the decision, but orbital excentration and orbital removal and clearance is done by us only. We I don't even stand in the OT when they are doing it. I really hate. It. <laughs> So I have done. Yeah, I stare at, at you. Four, Even when you four, remove it and see it, it is as if it's alive and it is looking at you. I, hate yeah. it. I think it's the most. I think that it's the most nasty operation in all the world. Very science. Right, Ravi. Ravi. Yes, sir. Uh, in 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 this uh, mucor orbital excentration, can the cornea be used for a transplant? Sir, hmm. uh, like I malignancy, we have a different. Think, sir, I don't think. I don't think because uh, we have done so many orbital excentration, but we have never uh, like no, no, uh, thought of or even uh, technically. Uh, I mean, the cornea is not involved, so it can be used. But uh, no. I suppose uh, there is a literature available. The disease die. If Dr. a disease Ravi, die, so we should not be using it. Doctor Ravi, there yes. is an article which says about Sumit, yes. which 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 talks about. uh putting amphotericin b solution and which causes corneal irritation and it does mention about this but then i don't think it can be used uh, so that is what i am saying i mean technically it can be but i mean routinely we are not using it we are just uh, sending it for histopathology examination so we'll just come to quickly come to the last two slides uh, dr shashi quickly summarize the management in case so we have already uh, dealt with quickly summarize how will you go about the surgery in a covid positive patient so covid positive patient uh, would generally require from in our institute two settings one is a local where we just do a superficial uh, take all the biopsies and uh, do a middle mitral antrostomy and everything and because patient is already on the uh, uh, amphotericin b you are just reducing the disease load and as soon as he gets a pulmonology clearance and other uh, clearance then we take up for uh, a complete clearance in 3 or 4 days uh, under complete general anesthesia so it's actually two sittings for us one to just reduce the pressure in the eye and reduce because uh, it doesn't give you too much of time you have to be within 45 minutes or 30 minutes and the patient is splurting blood and uh, everything so you don't want to do a 4 hour job under local anesthesia for hfno and bypass patient actually it's the same requirement that you have to do it under local uh, and it's it's really a pain because you, when we put a nasal catheter inside maybe a 10 or 12 and kind of advance it into the pharynx to give high flow oxygen and you're trying to put instruments in the nose they'll they'll be splattering out blood on your face uh, Uh, so it's it's if you could avoid those cases do it and we use a full face respirator uh, we don't have a papr but full face respirator I, i'm still covid negative and we have uh, at least i've done four of these cases with uh, you know patients fluttering on it so i think they kind of protect you okay okay thank you for the comment said so we need to have full precaution while dealing with the covid positive patients i think we can go for the next slide uh, prognosticate and how your patients uh, i mean from all the panelist what is your uh, experience regarding the morbidity and the mortality 
in the patients you have treated so sir can i start yes so, yes sir, dr tucker mentioned our experience we had uh, pre covid around uh, 25 uh, 28% mortality in overall mucor scenarios but uh, in the current uh, scenario we are seeing uh, prognosis it is just a feeling that prognosis is slightly better than it used to be in the pre uh, pre covid era uh, possibly because of etiopathogenesis so right now uh, we are looking at uh, 61 patients out of this uh, in recent uh, one or two weeks we had one mortality uh, there are a few patients who are not doing too well so uh, that is our experience and it has been that uh, the patients who have got more extensive disease if if graded on basis of rhino orbital or rhino orbito cerebral if it's a cerebral extension mortality is definitely higher and uh, positive higher. is bad yes sir all right so i think uh, we can go to the last uh, when and how to reconstruct uh, dr kapil dr sumit mentioned that it has to be multidisciplinary i totally agree with that you have to take into consideration uh, the complexity of defects that are uh, going to be created that way but uh, there is no urgency you don't need a plastic surgeon in your operation theater while you are dealing with these defects uh, your main uh, uh, focus right now is to uh, to assure safety of patients as well as your own colleagues so get these patients to operation theater whether to do it endoscopically open uh, ga or local anesthesia remove the uh, tissues that look unhealthy leave the defects as such maybe consider them for dressings and you can always consider for reconstruction later on today right. also rounds i i found that one patient was fairly well healed now his his uh, uh, his uh, uh, issues were changing from saving life to his rehabilitation because that happens after you have saved their life one month later they will have other vague problems ki bhari pan lag raha and now i have i cannot eat i cannot swallow that is the time that you can consider their uh, uh, rehabilitation options there are two right. options one is uh, prosthesis we have got very good uh, prosthodontics team which can create uh, uh, life like prosthesis even in complex defects like you have shown and other of course is uh, is uh, flaps uh, we we have a good plastic surgery uh, colleagues in my department as well as in plastic surgery department we can always consider even these major defects with a good uh, free flap reconstruction and over that you can put in a prosthesis uh, ocular prosthesis or artificial eye on a spectacle and uh, they can achieve a reasonable uh, uh, good i will not say very good but reasonable uh, right uh, so excellent okay. uh, dr kapil i think we need to involve uh, the prosthodontics as well as the plastic surgeons but obviously it should be done after the recovery so once the patient is fully recovered from uh, from mucor then patient can be taken up for reconstruction of the defects and you have to involve the uh, plastic surgeon and the prosthodontics for uh, rehabilitation right yeah. so i think we can uh, go to the next slide i think we have already covered the preventive part we have been discussing all the preventive measures to prevent because if we can prevent the disease that is the best prevention is better than cure we so so we have already discussed about the prevention uh, we have to control the sugars we have to control the um, the uh, yeah, uh, diabetes right so that is important and we have to uh, use the steroids very judiciously so uh, that is a very very important and all the domiciliary patients who are taking treatment in, at home they do not need, need any steroid so steroid is only required when patients ventilated patient or patient is on oxygen therapy so these are the patient so it should be very judicious use of steroid according to the guidelines which have been already uh, like uh, published by aims and icmr we need to uh, uh, prevent and uh, prevent the uh, the occurrence of mucor right so that is the last slides we can have audience questions so there are few audience questions we will just go uh, one by one if they are uh, good uh, i think we have discussed almost everything uh, i'm saying vaccination also prevents mucormycosis by reducing the severity of disease and need for steroids That's right that. right definitely definitely so there was a question like what is the risk of having mucormycosis in covid positive immunocompetent patient with no other comorbidity but receiving steroids so yes so anybody can take that okay there are two form of mucormycosis one is which happens in immunocompromised patients and there is one form of mucormycosis which is generally the pulmonary one which happens in immunocompetent and uh, immunocompetent the pulmonary mucormycosis can vary from aspergillosis or from mucormycosis it's a it's a challenge to diagnose that uh, because the presenting symptom may mimic other uh, 
differential diagnosis and the CTs are not very diagnostic of a pulmonary, it is difficult to distinguish between aspergillosis versus a mucormycosis. So right. immunocompromise generally see more of rhino orbital cerebral, whereas immunocompetence see more of the pulmonary variants. Right, I agree. I, agree. I, I, I want to ask, I want to just add on to it. Yes. Immunocompromise definition is very loose. So I... post-COVID, there is, there is a very prolonged uh, lymphopenia. Lymphocyte count is extremely less and the phagocytic function is severely depressed. And the only marker for that is IL-10, which is unfortunately not available. And most of these studies will show that IL-6, IL-10 ratio is the mo most important part. When you look at the TLC count, you may say he's immunocompetent, but he may be actually immunocompromised. And we actually had four cases in 19 who were not diabetics and who received very less steroids, very less that the sugars never went up to 200. But all of them had one thing very common, that the, TL, uh, the lymphocyte count was six or eight. So it's, it's sometimes a virus strain. Uh, and I, can, I have two cases where it was uh, eye swelling, but not mucor because their lymphocyte counts were 15 and above. So I can assure you, if you find a mucor patient who at the time of disease had lymphocyte count 15 or 20, it's very, very unusual that they will get a mucor. They will have either a bacterial cellulitis or something. So much so that my residents actually tease me that sir, ye to mucor hoga nahi, iska to lymphocyte count athara hai. And then we look at it, it, it doesn't turn out to be mucor. So now Shashi, I agree because neutropenia and lymphopenia are very common, uh, which which actually promotes a lot of uh... so neutrophil count is actually very high. They they because of steroid, there are 20,000, 15,000, 12,000. But these neutrophils are extremely incompetent, and there's no way to assess them except for the IL-10. SA, which is which is just not available. So our definition of immunocompromise, looking at the uh, usual definition, doesn't really hold good with the COVID patients. They they may have a severe phagocytic dysfunction, which will be missed unless you actually assay for IL-10. Okay. Uh, uh, thanks for the inputs. Uh, I have one more question from the audience. Uh, what is the role of capsofungin? Capsofungin is another antifungal agent which is uh, available. Uh, do you have any experience or is there any role of capsof capsofungin? capsofungin? Sir, can I answer that? Yes. Sir, apart from uh, what we have spoken about, azoles and uh, this, uh, you know, there are different drugs which help in, uh, in fact, uh, they are not primarily used in mucormycosis but they are a salvage treatment drugs when amphotericin, the patient cannot receive because of renal toxicity. Uh, there are different modes of mechanism where you can attack in case of a mucormycosis. Like we talk about uh, attacking the cell membrane and targeting the ergosterol. There are way uh, like azoles target the cytochrome P450. P450. Uh, capsofungin is generally used by the critical care people. It's a very expensive drug which is available. And it is an added drug, actually. It is not a primary mode therapy for this invasive uh, fungal infection. Apart uh, like this, uh, they, they enhance the delivery of other drugs to the target organs. Okay. But like not so, Dr. Dr. Manish, Dr. Manish, just a quick point. Yes, about yeah, one simple thing we must always remember. Fungi work on the principle of competitive inhibition. If you try to suppress a, a fungal reaction like mucormycosis, a fungal infection like mucormycosis, and you end up suppressing some competitive fungi around it, the, the so-called commensals, they may include some species of aspergillus, sacrophyces, and this thing. It has been found that the mucor may actually advance more rapidly. Right. So one has to be very careful that uh, when you're attacking, you know it's mucor, then try to attack only the mucor at the most at that time. Absolutely uh, correct. So, as a, so uh, I don't think there are... Uh, other uh, any other questions because everything we have already covered uh, there is a request uh, for dr jyoti's article so that i will be uh, sharing in the group and uh, uh, somebody wants to know where dr jyoti works so dr jyoti is professor of radiology at molanadar medical college so uh, so this is my very close friend and classmate right so uh, i can see dr achal gulati here uh, uh, welcome sir Good evening. So I would like to request Dr. Gulati for the final comments. I, 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 mean, I think Hi, this sir. has been one of the most marathon panels I've ever attended. Almost <laughs> three hours 
and I've been spellbound with it. I think that just goes on to show the quality of everybody, <clears throat> what they have presented. I think I just summarize one thing. Yes, sir. You know, the patients what we are looking at are somebody who's already spent two weeks, three weeks in the ICU and has come out. And he's again in for a bad time. So let us look at it in a humane approach. Let us not make a panic approach to the whole thing. It's a, you know, I would like to categorize it as a something like an iatrogenic disease which has been created by an overzealous treatment of everything. Yes, Let us not add to the further uh, agony of the patient by being overzealous in our management. You. you know, uh, suggestions coming out like something like maybe, you know, every third day an MRI, uh, the cost of medicines, something like 25, 30,000 rupees a day. We have to look at it from a human approach at this point of time when the patient and his family has been totally exhausted. So right. we need to look at it in a correct manner, maybe I do not know, I'm talking through my hat, but as a screening process, before the patient goes from the ICU, maybe we can do a, a nasal endoscopy as a screening procedure, take a good swab area, subject it, and then send the patient home. At least we know that he's not gone in from uh, gone in from the ICU. You know, ICU is the bed of hotbed of m quite a few of the issues which we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So rest everything has been dealt with in a very nice manner. And I think these are just a few of my thoughts which I was having on to this. But Ravi, it was a very well-moderated panel and every every one of the panelists really stood out of his um, boots to show the best of it. Uh, I, I saw Sumit, I saw Praveen, I saw Gautam, Manish, uh, everybody, Ishwar, you know, uh, Shashi, everybody has been outstanding in this whole thing. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you so much for organizing it. Thanks for joining sir thank you very much sir so i thank all the panelists for their inputs it was a really uh, marathon i would say we ha have been discussing for almost two hours so everybody uh, i think uh, is now right, tired uh, two hours so, and uh, minutes. i would like to have yes sir it is one hour 45, 45 minutes, minutes. Two so hours we have, 45 we have minutes. crossed our limits <laughs> we have crossed yeah. our time limit but anyway it was a very enlightening uh, discussion we had on COVID Ravi, and I'm sure I think all the members I, and delegates would have I think Ravi, benefited. In for the yes. world record of having one of the longest well-attended panel discussion I was seeing, the number of attendees has not yes. gone down except till right at the very end. I forgot yeah, to right mention Vipin Kapil and uh, Alok who also did a very great right. job into the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can I can see that <laughs> sir on the, on the YouTube also there were around 60 participants and we had 100 plus participants on the Zoom meeting. So I, I think it was a good uh, attended meeting. Uh, I really thank all the panelists and would like to have final comments if anybody has so that we can just uh, uh, stop. So, uh, Ravi, I would like to say that yes, sir. COVID is it's a burning hot topic and it is the judicious use of steroids which need to look into this and diabetes is one of the predisposing factors. And we can uh, prevent it by using the uh, 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 steroids in a judicious manner, as I said earlier, and have a personal hygiene and early diagnosis by, as Dr. Gulati said, so um, by early this thing, as the patient goes out from ICU, so have a nasal endoscope and ENT people have a definite or most important role to early diagnose so that patient doesn't go into an extensive stage so that it can be taken care at the earliest. I also thank everybody on behalf of Delhi OI as a president and it was the idea of Ravi to start this since it's a very hot topic and it has been discussed in newspapers and it, everybody's panicky about this. So we planned this and at a short notice we could manage it and I thank the guest speaker, uh, guest panelist uh, Jyoti who did a good job and Alok who, gave a, uh, who was the opening batsman and Ravi was the middleman who, who, around whom the whole panel uh, rotated. And all the panelists, Parveen, Mun Manish Munjal, Sumit, and then um, uh, Kapil and uh, Vipin, and uh, lastly, Vipin. our friend, uh, friend Shashi, from Dr. Shashi Dhar. Shashi Dhar and uh, G.B. Singh. So I thank everybody. And uh, it has been a longest panel uh, discussion, as Dr. Uh, Gulati said. It's already 8.45 or 8.50, I'll say.
so i think every and lastly the audience without whom the panel is of no use so i saw it's more than 100 people who are attending and i don't know about the youtube you said it uh, around how many there were 60 at a time but now so there are 150 are... people attended this or 160 so it is a well attended and i think everyone got up some or the other clue for their problem or whatever they had a question and it had been a wonderful experience and i hope we'll do it more often thank you very much and uh, good night to everyone thank, thank you, you. Good night. Good thank night. you sir